This is Duke University. We're delighted to have uh, Charles Taylor with us today. Uh, for most of you, he needs no introduction. Uh, I'll remark that he is a, was a McGill undergraduate, a graduate student at Oxford, and has written many, many books ever since. Uh, I was just talking about my first acquaintance with him, which was his book on Hegel, uh, written in the 1970s when I was at the Hegel Archive. Uh, we're here today to uh, sort of have a conversation with him more, more uh, about two of his uh, more recent books, uh, the first, The Sources of the Self, and then uh, A Secular Age. We're going to start the first session by focusing on sources of the self, but that won't be, uh, we, we understand that conversation will range, uh, will range across um, more areas than that. The, um, and we're going to have, for each session, a graduate student begin with a short summary and a few questions to get us off, but then we'll take uh, general questions. There are microphones. Uh, the whole um, um, seminar is being filmed, so uh, please, when you want to talk, just uh, gesticulate in some wild way. Uh, I will keep a list of people on who, who, are, who are scheduled to talk, and uh, we'll recognize you in turn. Um, and, but please wait to talk until the microphone comes to you. So uh, we're going to start uh, with Sam Bagg, who is a graduate student who's talking first about uh, sources of the self. So can everybody hear me? Sort of, I can hear. OK, great. So thanks, everybody, for being here, um, and especially, of course, to Charles Taylor. Um, I'm incredibly grateful for this opportunity to present my comments. Um, I could go on about how influential Taylor's work has been for me, as I'm sure it's been for many of you. But since I have already the absurd task of reducing a book as rich and important as Sources of the Self to a five or 10 minute presentation, I'd better get started. Um, so the book itself is in five parts. Um, part one focuses on a critique of a central feature of contemporary moral and political theory, which is variously referred to as the priority of the right over the good, the centrality of obligation to moral theory, the replacement of substantive reason with procedural reason, and the suppression of moral ontology. According to Taylor, it is impossible to approach the world as these theories require in a, uh, in a neutral way without holding some background assumptions or affirming some sort of qualitative distinctions. Um, so any, supposedly any supposed neutrality or procedural reason or rightness is always parasitic on some unarticulated vision of the good, um, a vision that is of necessity substantive, non-neutral. Um, and it's important for us then to articulate these visions of the good. The sources, and this is, you know, these are the sources of the modern self, these visions of the good, um, which the book tries to articulate. Um, and so the remaining four parts of the book um, do just this. They attempt this voyage of articulation. Um, so in, starting in part two, um, Taylor develops a notion of inwardness, uh, which he traces from Plato's vision of rational self-mastery through Augustine and Descartes to what Taylor calls the punctual self of John Locke which exerts control over the external world by taking an objective stance on it, by disengaging from it, retreating into a pure unified subjectivity. Thus, the emergence of disengaged rational autonomy is the first major thread in Taylor's picture of the development of the modern self. In part three, a second storyline emerges, the affirmation of ordinary life. This is more intimately tied with the Christian tradition, and specifically its egalitarian ideal of universal beneficence. It entails an unprecedented focus on family life, romantic love, um, as well as a high value on craft, labor, production. Um, and this, this second half of it is at least as essential for the development of science, for example, um, as the sort of disengaged Cartesian subject that's usually posited at, as the fount of science. Um, in part four, we encounter the final source of modern identity, uh, highlighted by Taylor, what he calls the voice of nature. Um, if Locke and perhaps Bentham are the paradigmatic thinkers of the first and second sources, then here it, it must be Rousseau, whose conviction that civilization was a corrupting force led him to uphold nature as fundamentally good. It also led him to view the will rather than the intellect as the central moral capacity. 
building on Rousseau, Kant goes one direction, interpreting the voice of nature through our common nature as rational beings, while the Romantics emphasized our particular natures, our unique individual uh, natures, our inner depths, as Taylor calls them. The human good for the Romantic is authentic self-expression rather than rational autonomy. Finally, in part five, Taylor brings the voyage uh, of articulation to a close, examining what he calls the subtler languages of modernist literature and supposedly postmodernist theory, both of which he sees as responding to the conflicts embedded in this peculiarly modern um, combination of moral sources, which have remained with us in much the same form um, since the Victorian era, um, Taylor argues. Central among these is the conflict between the rational, punctual self of the Enlightenment and the unique, expressive self um, of Romanticism. Of course, there's infinitely more levels of complexity to the actual work than this, but one has to simplify. Uh, <clears throat> so, in, in any way, <clears throat> um, these settler languages uh, for Taylor don't represent a satisfactory solution um, to the conflicts of modernity. And he gives us just a hint that perhaps a theological uh, worldview is the only way out. Um, so now that I've given this hopelessly reductive survey, I have two related questions that I want to raise. And here I'll turn to address the author, so I'm not saying addressing the third person anymore. <laughs> uh, so I know that you've written, of course, on both of the topics that I'm about to mention before, but I figured it'd be silly to try to find some question that nobody had ever asked you before, so uh, tw 25 years after the book came out. So I'm I'm, my aim is just to kind of start the discussion off in a direction that I find particularly interesting um, and then see where that takes us with you know, your response and, and, and anybody else who wants to follow it up or not. Um, so in that spirit, my first question concerns the relationship of, uh, between your project and that of other projects um, that are critical of neutral or procedural um, visions of politics. And so I'm thinking, you could think of many people here, I'm thinking perhaps particular of Foucault, um, people like Foucault who also point to certain background assumptions um, supporting liberalism. Um, the difference between your project and theirs, it seems to me, is that the background assumptions they point to seem to be quite sinister, um, while the, the, those you illustrate seem quite benign. It seems like they are sort of different background assumptions that you're pointing to. Um, but their histories are therefore framed as these kind of debunking, destructive genealogies, while yours are framed as these retrievals and these articulations of our moral sources. And you're very critical, of course, of, of these debunking genealogies. Um, largely, it seems, um, because they are unable to justify their identification of certain background assumptions as sinister. Um, and it seems to me that the, a similar thing might be said of your view, actually. Um, your identification of certain background assumptions as benign. Right? So one of the critiques of, the, of sources of the self is that you don't necessarily say why we should retrieve the moral sources that you so carefully uh, and convincingly trace. Um, and, in, and indeed, you acknowledge that the project of providing kind of objective foundations for our moral sources, convincing the skeptic that they're true, something like that, is, um, is, is a hopeless project. So you articulate in, in more detail the moral sources we may or may not hold, which Foucault doesn't do. Um, but you don't articulate why we should hold them. Um, so this much, it seems, is left implicit, this kind of why we should adopt them, um, necessarily unarticulated. Is it possible, then, that there's a kind of symmetry between these kind of debunking genealogies and the retrievals you perform? Neither project can provide objective justification for their views. Instead, both projects seem to me to rely on the strength of their narratives. Um, and their implicit effect on our judgments and our allegiances. Now, I think this is a good thing, but it seems to me that it's a feature of both projects. So my second question is related, mm -hmm. um, but it focuses more on, the, on this particular narrative itself. At the end of the book, you argue that the, that the three broad sources of the modern self necessarily come into conflict, um, if I've interpreted you right, but that, but that we should affirm all of them anyway, accepting the kind of pluralism of goods that this entails. Um, but I wonder, uh, why this particular conclusion follows um, from your arguments. For example, you illuminate how the auto um, <clears throat> that autonomy and authenticity are both dependent on a concept of a unitary self. You also show that the modernist literature and the postmodernist theory um, both give us a critique of that unitary self. 
Uh, and, and, and indeed, you seem to accept this critique. Our practice of locating agency in individuals um, is a historical phenomenon. Uh, and, and you claim that this is actually a truism amongst, uh, amongst historians and anthropologists. You also say, for example, that the best philosophy of the 20th century has destroyed the idea of the disengaged self. Um, similarly, there's no truly authentic version of the self. Our identities are always sites of conflict. So, it seems, so, gi so given that the ideals of autonomy and authenticity necessarily come into conflict, and given that they both rely on the same problematic foundation, um, why should we hold on to them? Why not accept the modernist solution of denying unitary agency? It seems to me that this solution, rejecting the moral sources of autonomy and authenticity, um, is actually consistent with continued affirmation of, uh, affirmation of ordinary life, which is the third moral source. Um, and indeed, it seems to me that this is exactly what, um, the, what's, what, what you call modernism does. Um, and and, and you know, even people like perhaps Foucault, which you classify as sort of in, in league with the modernists, um, if only implicitly, of course. Um, so to sum up, my first question is basically, what sorts of reasons might we have to affirm the moral sources that you seek to retrieve in general? Sort of what kind of reasons do we have? And the second question is, why should we affirm in particular the, the, the moral sources of the autonomous disengaged self and the authentic expressive self when, they both seemed, when those seem to be so problematic? Um, so thank you for this opportunity, and thank you. <laughs> Small equations, which <laughs> I, in order just to, as I stagger into the answer in order to maybe gain time, I'd want to make a point about Foucault, that the Foucault I criticized the, in that period, I'd, I'm forgotten if I, in, in the book, but I'd turned mm -hmm. in that period, mm -hmm. is, has been superseded by the Foucault that I hadn't read yet. It, you know, I was just in the course of, well, when the book came out, he was already dead. But I mean, in the course of writing it, he was just in the course of giving these really interesting lectures in the Collège de France, in which some of the features that I criticized in the Foucault, let's say, of the, you know, of the order of things, of discipline and punish, and the first volumes of the history of sexuality, he really goes totally beyond them. And uh, I mean, there's a certain attempt a little bit to hide what he's getting at and what really is him to him and what he really wants to, am I not close enough? Yeah, a little bit to, uh, you know, he talks about different epistemi which just kind of succeed each other, no explanation of why, no issue of whether they're better or worse in, in for instance, the order of things. Uh, but um, the Foucault who gives these lectures in the College of France is really quite different and he's laying out all his sources very clearly and, <clears throat> and you can see much better where he's coming from, where he's going to, I mean, what his, what his ethical uh, judgments are. So I don't classify him, uh, I shouldn't you know, anymore, as I, <clears throat> as I did then. So, okay, that's having delayed <laughs> the answer to this question that long, let me try to, to jump into it. I mean, I, th the, I think the part of the answer to your question comes out of the first part of the book, that we can't <clears throat> help live by a certain conception of what is, what is good. And our identity, insofar as we want to speak in terms of identity, is closely bound up with that, so we don't even have an identity. So there are notions of the good life, indeed, that think it can only be achieved at the expense of what a lot of people have thought of as the unitary self. I mean, and there are many, many versions of that. I mean, for instance, the various forms of the romantic movement itself take the as it were, hegemonic self of Kantian rationality, which is meant to be really on top of things, and, and want to say that the good life as they understand it has to come from a <clears throat> rebellion against, against that and so on. But, and there are even, you know, maybe further out ideas about, about the ultimately opening ourselves to, to chaos and so on the chaos in, in the self, but once again, let's get back to the human condition, you can't live without some notion of the good and, you ha and it has to be somehow expressed and realized in your life, right? So now so we can go many places from here. One is to ask the question, well, how do you establish which of these different possibilities on offer? And 
uh, there we come to huge parting of the ways in modern philosophy because in modern well, Anglo-Saxon philosophy anyway, right? Because there are two very powerful answers to this which would suppress the question in one way and the other. I mean, let's say human can't or the, or the patron saints. The, the human one is, well, just that there are certain, if you like, reactions we have which we understand as ethical because they have a certain ring for us, right? Of approval and disapproval, and that's the way it is. And no question of justifying or not justifying, though he thinks if you figure out what these are, they turn out to be things that most of us like, like sympathy towards other human beings. But the, the basic answer, how do you justify, is you know it. I mean, it's just, it is absurd that we are moved by these things. And the Kant-derived one, which is in constant mortal conflict in the, in the Anglo-Saxon uh, Philosophical Academy, says, no, on the contrary, there's a, a modes of reason which don't involve taking one form of the good life and saying this is the really the right one, but which involve reason of some kind of procedural type, right? Either can you universalize the maxims of the action, can you have a, be acting on a norm which all the people who are affected by it would accept, that's the Habermas version, uh, can you give a set of reasons which if all your addressees agree that the reasons have to be applied, you know, um, uh, impartially to everybody, would be reasons that they would have to accept, scandal, uh, and, you know, there's, there's an infinite set of variations on this. Um, or are you as engaged in a human being with a life plan, etc., such that you can't deny that this is equally valid for everyone else as a course guard? You know. So I think all these forms of the Kantian um, version of this fail. They don't, they don't convince. They don't, they don't, the idea that I'm logically compelled to <clears throat> just doesn't, doesn't work. So where could you possibly turn if human can't don't work? I mean, that must be it's the end of the intellectual uh, universe. Well, I don't think it is. I think, once again, we have to do a bit more phenomenology, maybe, and look at how we actually operate, because we're not without capacity for self-criticism in, as we begin to live, our understanding of the good, and we always start with one. We always, we always have to have one. It's, or, I mean, it's a matter of tremendous intellectual and personal crisis to be really totally uncertain or to have our, the one we've been living break down on us. But there are ways of thinking about this, in particular when you think that the notion of the good life is not just a set of models up there. You know, take Aristotle, read the virtues, that's it, or take someone else, read their virtues. No, it's a much more uh, implicitly complex and um, multi-sided system. I mean, for instance, if you have some idea of the good life, you have some idea of what the motivations are that human beings have which pull them away from that in general, of what are the motivations that human beings have that pull them towards that or that are satisfied by that. And with this uh, palette, if you like, of motivations is part of how you understand the world around you, other people, what you do, what people have done in history. And <clears throat> when you begin to see the world through this palette, in all sorts of ways it can be upset. I mean, for instance, there can be very good people who don't seem to be <laughs> motivated by what you think are the essential motivations. I mean, this is always the approach made to very many Christians. You know, they, they have all these saints and so on, it's great, but now here we have somebody, a remarkable person who is an atheist. You know, Hume himself, of course, is a famous example of this. That he, as he was dying, he was very serene and so on, and Boswell going crazy. I mean, you don't believe in God. How, how, can, you <laughs> how can you be serene about this? So, there are all sorts of ways in which this very large bundle of 
both ideals, senses of a good life, and so on, and the understanding of human life and what the alternatives are, and, and I mean, another whole set of issues. How much can human beings transform themselves or be transformed to fit with my highest conception of the good life, right? So here we have Christians arguing with Nietzscheans, right? I mean, so you have this idea of, yes, one of this kind of total agape and so on. And Nietzsche's like, clearly it's no, not on, I mean, not on. So what's going on here is clearly something else. I mean, you guys are trying to pull one up the ship on other people and <clears throat> say that you're, you're better and higher and their lives are, are lower. So what you must be activated by ultimately is ressentiment or some kind of uh, will to power. You see how as these two positions confront each other, they're not just barely, you know, the highest life is agape, the highest life is the assertion of the Ibramesh. No, they're not just these bold statements. They are whole ways of understanding and interpreting and living and what kinds of conflicts you have within yourself and your life and <clears throat> between what and what and is it, all these are these interpretive schemata. So what you have here as we operate in life is our constant, if we're honest, we're constantly being upset. Our particular palette is obviously punched holes in by the way the other people are, the way we find ourselves <laughs> suddenly motivated to be, and we have to go on trying to make sense of this. Now, so another word is the H word is now going to finally pop out, right? Uh, it, this is a hermeneutic type of procedure. So what we have here is the position that the one I'm trying to defend, and I tried to defend at the beginning of the book, we have a, we don't take off with Hume, but Hume's got a point, because the basic intuitions that we start with that keep us, that get us going and that move us along are never uh, intuitions of a totally dispassionate kind, right? We speak of intuitions in different ways. You know, when people say, let's see, we have, a, we have grammatical intuitions is, uh, ain't necessarily so correct English, and, oh, oh, my grammatical intuition. But that's not the same thing as my strong intuition that you know, human beings everywhere have rights, and I have this. There's something that we are, we are moved by that, you know, that we see people acting, going out mid saint saint frontières to the Congo, and we feel admiration. I mean, this kind of intuition is a, what I want to call felt intuition. So, you know, one for you, David, that's, uh, Hume gets that, gets that point. But where he, I think he gets it wrong is you can't separate this kind of intuition from what people understand it as, namely a perception of something which is <clears throat> really good. So how does reason carry on from here? It doesn't preempt all that stuff by coming in from kind of procedural heights. It, on the contrary, works through the interpretive struggle that we all have to work through in life. And you can feel that you're making headway if you meet certain objections, if you're able to cope with some of the phenomena of life as you live it and people around you live it. And it's, it's a kind of hermeneutic reason is how, what I want to call that as a shorthand. And that is what, uh, I mean, moral and, and ethical reasoning is all about. Now, just a minute, was that the question? Um, I'm sorry, I got on. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should stop here and let people interrupt. But I, I haven't fully answered your question, but I certainly touched on yes, a, a bit of it. Yeah. <clears throat> maybe. Shall we open yeah. up for questions? Yeah, let's have more. Yes. Is this thing on? All right. Um, okay, so my question is about when these intuitions, because some of the intuitions you raised were intuitions that are of a relatively universal character. There are very few people who would be like, ah, oh, you made sense and frontier, you know, the bunch of schlubs, you know. <laughs> you know, very few people are going to have that reaction. Yeah. But there are intuitions that people have, and I think that they feel profoundly in, in a way that's beyond grammar around things like, 
gay marriage or other issues where some people have like very clear competing intuitions. To some people it's clearly obvious, for example, that that's wrong. Yeah. To some people it's absolutely obvious that it's right. So I'm wondering about how one would start to articulate the basis for that sort of judgment. You know, how would one talk about that in an intelligent way that could help bridge things that are obvious to, to two different groups of people? Well, I mean, I think that that's a really good example of what I'm talking about, that, that uh, a lot of people who think gay marriage is wrong think that that kind of sexual expression is in some way degraded, undiscriminating, and so on, okay? So, you know, I could have believed that myself, but I've met people in my life that that just doesn't fit. And so I speak to people who are still holding on to that view and say, look, you've got to admit reality into your view. I mean, think it was a Christian view. You don't want to deal with human beings you know, as they really are. So I think this is a case with massive amount of assumptions of the way things are built into the condemnation. Now, the felt, you're right. I mean, there's where, the, where Hume looks as though he's partly right. The feltness of the felt intuition may be so powerful that it may carry you through <laughs> Not, <laughs> not wanting to admit tons of stuff out there. But if you ask them to unpack the film, what's wrong with this, right, then it begins to get onto areas where a question arises. Is that really the right perception of these people? Right? And I think that's a very, very good example of how... You see, if, if we think of... This is the whole problem with the, since G. Moore and those guys. I mean, they have this idea that we have these very punctual intuitions. That's the right way. And that just as you can't do anything with them to argue with them, so you, in the end, you get G. Moore says, okay, it's intuitionism, right? What is good? Well, what is it? Friendship and beautiful states of mind or something? That's good. Okay, everyone sees that. That's right. Okay, so then we move from there to uh, start arguing what brings about these things, and that's what the argument is about, which really, in a certain sense, concedes the case to him, right? that everything is instrumental, all the reasoning is instrumental, and, you know, but that's, that seems to me to be in all in various forms of this approach, travesty of what we really are living. Thank you very much for answering our questions here. It seems that there's a procedural dimension maybe to the way you describe the way we expand our intuitions. And I, I was hoping maybe you can comment a little bit more on that because while it may become a little extreme in Kant, even in Rousseau we're thinking about expanding our understanding and our intuitions by simply meeting more and more people because we're tricked into, by being in small groups, we're sort of tricked into assuming that all people are either rich or poor, either part of our society or the enemy, either part of our religious group or a no. completely opposite and damned religious group. So is, isn't there a procedural element to what you're suggesting here? The more we expand our intuitions, the better they are honed towards uh, offering us some sort of truth, and I wonder how mm -hmm. that plays out. Well, I mean, then the procedure simply is look at the reality. I mean, procedurism has got to be <laughs> not our scope. Like, you know, could you universalize this maxim? Could you will this maxim be universal? That gives me a clear understanding of what the procedure is and uh, how, how to apply it. And if you extend proceduralism to be just, well, look, then, uh, then I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's procedural. But the whole point is that of people who offer these Kantian things is to circumvent that kind of looking. Right? Circumvent looking by showing that there's some kind of self-contradiction or self-undermining in taking that maxim and, and universalizing it. And, and what I'm saying is there's always an element of actually seeing I mean, the, okay, put it in other ways. If you have one of these views, you may not realize it, I'm, but I'm trying to tell <laughs> you that you have a very multivaried interpretive schema, right, for how to go around the world and see people and understand them. So, so my procedural request or proposal is 
see if it fits. <laughs> see what I mean? It's just everything goes. And that there's all sorts of ways in which you can find yourself having to do this. There isn't a single set of moves that will answer your question. Charles, can I, can yeah. I just expand on that question a little yeah. bit? Um, we, make, we make these kinds of hermeneutic judgments in the context of interpretive communities. And it, it, to build on Alex's question, it seems almost as if you're, you're telling us that we need to constantly expand our hermeneutic community. Yeah. And I wonder whether or not that doesn't lead to what Heidegger called rootless cosmopolitanism. Uh, and if there is a cosmopolitan point of view, which again is a kind of Kantian so. term, or whether we don't, we're, we aren't always limited. And if we're limited, how we, how we have to choose between the communities we're, yeah, we're yeah. parts of. Okay, well it depends whether you're a, a Kantian and you're basically going to look, or a Hegelian, or I mean, let's not take Hegel in now, no. but uh, ultimately a Heideggerian, you see. I'm taking Gadamer as my example of the Heideggerian influence, right? So it's not the cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan means you stand nowhere. You stand in a kind of open space in which all different societies and communities are equidistant from you and from that standpoint, but doing you see. And that's another thing that it doesn't I don't want to recommend. But what I want to recommend is the kind of Gadamerian meeting the other infusing horizon. You listen. And that's what we're all doing all the time in the modern world. I mean, we have these massive debates, like we just went through one in Quebec, you know, about whether we apply this new secularist charter, which says that people who wear certain kinds of religious symbols can't get jobs in the public sector. And a lot of us said that's, uh, that's unconscionable. And as you work out the argument, you begin to see that the people who are for this have all kinds of presumptions about how the people who wear those symbols are operating, what they're motivated by, what they're trying to do, and so on. Very worrying presumptions, which are just not true. Right? And as a matter of fact, the more we find that people in the society had a chance to frequent those people, the less they're likely to vote for this stuff. Right? So, so you see some of the kids in the school who are sitting side by side with Muslims, and they're saying, What's going on? These, these grown-ups are crazy. We always thought they were crazy. Now we, we know they're So you see that here we're called upon, and that's the nature of multicultural modern society in a certain sense. We're called upon to open up our communities of interpretation and make broader ones with some kind of fusion with others. So we're never adopting, if you from nowhere, we're never adopting cosmopolitanism. It's not about leaping to cosmopolitanism. We're managing to extend our area of civility and community with other human beings in a to a broader set of conversations in a very slow, painful, one by one, step by step process. That's the only way. See, you don't win these battles like the battle we had in Quebec, alas. You don't win them by reading Kant. I mean, it would be good if, if people, you know, say, look, <laughs> universal. Or I mean, even, you know, even Habermas that would condemn uh, this, obviously. He says, look, I mean, all those affected by the legislation should be able to buy into the norm, right? Obviously, the people that are going to be excluded are not going to be able to buy into the norm. So I'm reading you, Jürgen Habermas, you know, you, Quebec voters voting. But that's, that's not how you actually win, and we didn't win, they defeated themselves, but never mind, we, we, we'll win next time. We, the, that's how you actually win is by this kind of convincing people that that's, that's a travesty. You are looking at a caricature of these people, and therefore you think it's right to treat them that way, talk to them, you know, find out about them, and that's how it, when it works, it works. And that shows how fragile it is, that shows how difficult it is, but I mean, that's the, you know, that's human life. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I, I, am, I have been imagining a conversation between you and one of the ha new happiness economists of a kind I think we all recognize, who says, my program for people is that they should pay constant attention to their subjective hedonic states, note it every 10 minutes, and then try to maximize their engagement in the activity that <coughs> induces the happiest states. And I think if I'm trying to channel your work, which I've 
I've <laughs> benefited enormously from over, over the years. Um, I say, yes, as to Hume, your feeling is not separable from a perception of value. And I think then the person says, yes, that's right. But the perception I have reduces to this, that happiness is good. The rest I see as a sort of ancestral residue which we've shaken off. And then I say, yes, but this view of yours seems to be possible only on two historical conditions at least. One of um, the dignity of the disengaged subject who can stand back and observe his own experiences. The other, a certain version of universal beneficence as with the sort of thing that lay behind Bentham. And the person might again say, yes, um, I understand that those were the historical preconditions of my being as I am, but here I am and I say that the feeling I have reflects only the perception of value, that happiness is good. And that's all I have to say, and the rest just doesn't interest me anymore. So I guess it, when the next thing to say to that person, and this is actually a question motivated by being around lawyers and social scientists please, and please. policy people all the time, right? Yeah. Do we say, you still don't understand yourself in some deep way you actually don't understand yourself? Or do we say, here is a form of life and we've run out of the things we can say to it? Or do we say, here is a form of life and so much has been lost in getting to this? Well, I mean, you know, Plato, you, you're saying something like that, but you're also saying that if you face really what all this means, right? So, I mean, I've got this drug here that can keep you in a state like that for the rest of the years you have to live. That's the good life. Take it. Well, just a minute. No, let's do that. I don't think anybody would fail to have that kind of stand back from that. So it can't just be, I mean, this is this, I'm modernizing an argument in Plato, right? You know, you know, uh, this can't just, be, people can't un really understand themselves if that's what they think. Hedonic states, hedonic states independent of any judgment of what is worthwhile and good, you know, I mean, are you talking about the pleasure even of playing golf well? Okay. Uh, what about that, right? Well, that's not pure because it's not just that you have to, it, it's, it involves becoming excellent, right? Can you, uh, you know, can you, uh, I mean, you can see that this, the, the mind boggles very quickly and you see that the people don't know what they're talking about. Now, this is what we always do in philosophy. We don't know a lot of the times that we're talking about and philosophy is a, tremendous struggle out of various ways of not knowing what we're talking about. It's rather like, you know, so G more, these states are kind of just set up there as, as, as ends, and nobody really lives that way. So you're right that a lot of the work of philosophy is getting people, you know, that's why Plato's really very good, getting people to see that they don't actually think that way, they don't actually judge that way. If I, if I might, just yeah. briefly, <clears throat> I get the question does, I guess, mean to go to those stakes. And it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a genuine question in that I think the person might actually say, yes, it's about playing golf well, but I actually mean that playing golf well is instrumental to feeling good. And they might actually say to the experience machine, you know, the modern example of the yeah. Response, the platonic yeah, that's response. Right. Right, 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 right. Right. Plato is like right. plug yeah. myself in. Yeah. Um, yeah. They might actually say, well, just as in the headscarf debate, we're not really talking about jihadis, so let's not talk about jihadis, right? They'd say, here, we're not really talking about science fiction. We're really talking about people living their lives. Yeah. And I'm telling you that in this world of consultants and therapists <laughs> and personal trainers, what we are really aiming at is, is happiness. Um, and it seems at, part of what's at stake is the recuperation of the necessity and the dignity of the history of ideas and of implied ontologies, the things that we all love as ways of making sense of life um, as lived by people who aren't in our little worlds. And it does, it does strike me that <clears throat> 
this subculture might be a very, not subculture, this um, mode of being may be a very fully inhabited departure from or challenge to that. And that's, I ask it because it bothers me. Well, fully, yeah. Fully, what was it, fully departed from or fully, you have to be able not to be like all the people that obviously aren't like that. Okay, take small kids, right? Small kids at a certain point, they say, uh, you know, do it self. I want to do it myself. I want to, don't pick me up or climb up. It's very important to them. That's like, that's a very, that's the ur moment of the golf game, you see. Do you grow out of this? I mean, <laughs> that's people. Or, were you not like that as a kid? You were here and here and here, you know? Uh, in which case, <laughs> you would have been therapized of, uh, into you know, oblivion. But see, it's, there is a real question here as to whether that is not just blinding yourself. We're, uh, human beings are capable of ideological blindness of an incredible degree, as we all know in the politics that we've lived in the 20th century and so on. If we only get the, you know, the whatever it is, the dictators of the proletariat, everyone's going to be very happy and so on. And <clears throat> You're capable of blinding, one's capable of blinding oneself. And what philosophy from the very beginning is there for is to point out various ways in which you're obviously leaving something very big out of your, out of your, of your calculus. Thomas. Oh, yeah, over there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, like, like most here in this room, I've, uh, over the years, benefited immensely from your work, and I'm very grateful, at last, that I don't have to watch you only on YouTube, uh, <laughs> which is a less <laughs> exciting experience. Um, so, I wanted to pick up a little bit on something you said yesterday in the conversation with Luke Bretherton, uh, fairly at the beginning, really. Um, and you, if I, and, and correct me if my paraphrase of it seems, seems off, but I had the impression that you were offering a kind of characterization of Christianity as having to so significantly accommodate itself to a dramatically altered uh, social, political, and cultural landscape, um, uh, that certain features, as I believe you put it, uh, needed to be kept, others almost certainly to be jettisoned or in some sense to be sort of surrendered um, uh, because they seem to conform uh, in palpably inadequate ways to, to the realities at hand. So um, naturally we all are familiar with the kind of charge law uh, sort of you know that's that's voiced from within certain very hard nosed quarters of uh, catholicism that there's a certain version of foot of uh, cafeteria catholicism yeah, okay. that that does something of the sort and so my question really wants to sort of ask it's really a question about the sources of normativity and to what extent those sources in the end always have to be transcendent to the particular set of practices that they seek to regulate. And so if I look at uh, some of a rather, uh, I mean, a fairly extensive roll call, I'll just give a few names, um, so of the figures associated with desert monasticism, St. Francis, Maximus the Confessor, Joachim of Fiore, Augustine, Savonarola, Pascal, Bonhoeffer, Christ himself. I don't come across this idea that um, I mean, in all these cases, to put it positively, a, a key feature seems to be that to hold the seculum and its inhabitants uh, to account by reference to standards that are precisely not derived from the seculum. And so the question that I feel uh, arises in my mind again mm -hmm. is how do you actually reconcile what I think is a very main major feature certainly of Christianity, as to how the sources of normative claims are to be disentangled from the set of practices uh, for the regulation of which we invoke them. Now there are possibilities, uh, and some, one of which I think is, is sort of more closely uh, sort of related to your project as I've understood it, uh, 
one might think, for instance, of sort of you know, accounts, Platonist accounts, even by an atheist like Iris Murdoch, of, sort of you know, how to cultivate morally accurate vision, to use a favorite phrase of hers, or forms of attention. Uh, or one might think of someone doing something rather similar, like Gerald Manley Hopkins with his sort of sacramental poetics. On the other hand, there is, of course, the whole virtue ethics. Uh, debate, and this is the one that I'm, I'm sort of especially wondering about, and perhaps with implicit reference to McIntyre's work, because in the case, especially of of the virtues and the virtue ethics, one of the key features that is often ignored by modern uh, moral theory is that we don't actually reason our way into them, but we grow into them. They are part of an educational process that begins because before, long before a child would even know that there is such a strange thing as philosophy uh, or theology. Right? So that, that to me the question is, are in many ways the sources not only transcendent in the sense that they cannot conceptually be derived from within a set of practices that needs itself to be legitimated, but are they also transcendent in the temporal sense, that in fact we incubate them at a point where we are not yet conceptually active? And so that's sort of where I wondered whether your, what I found to be an, a perhaps uh, excessively accommodationist view, if that's a word, of, of Christianity, yes, uh, as you voiced it yesterday, find it a little bit perplexing, because it seems to me the only way that, say, the uh, virtues can be inculcated in a being is by making that being part of a community and, and its practices, mm -hmm. um, and from probably a fairly early age on. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, but okay, but then let's, uh, let's take the um, Christian faith as the example of this, right? So what's been going on the last 2,000 years? That you have events of the following kind, that um, there are certain institutions existing, or maybe not yet existing, but there are certain um, ways of dealing with certain human wants, needs, and so on. And along have come at various periods in history, members of the Christian church, and said, well, there's a huge gap here. So you find in the early church that uh, they begin to dedicate themselves to setting up hospices, hospitals, going out, and, or, you know, and then let's not look at the early period of Mother Teresa lands in Calcutta. And, so you have what the gospel is telling you about what we should be doing in the world. And you see right away there's a huge hole in this. Or maybe it's not even worse than that. There's a huge anti-operation <laughs> that's, that's going against this. That is the critique of the sacred one. And that is still going on. The question is, can it go on best by conforming to what the existing magisterium thinks is the continuing and unchanging tradition, or can it go on best by altering that? Now, there the so many cases in which it's been the second <clears throat> that we need to ask ourselves why we should assume that the first is the you know is the default solution. Right? So when Bias the Ninth told us that any uh, you know, adjustment to democracy was something. Oh, is that the way of making life better, more human for people? Uh, supporting <laughs> various authoritarian regimes, ultimately, mostly? Uh, probably not. So I don't know what is meant by accommodation to the sacred. I think that what you have to accommodate to is the reality of human life and what the gospel means for reaching out to people in, this, in these circumstances. And see, that's why I think that, well, the, I think the very, I think your question is a much too, uh, how shall I say, static notion of practices, right? That there are these practices going on, the practices in the secular, and practices in the church. Yeah, they're always changing, and sometimes they have to change to be true to themselves. And <clears throat> so accommodationism, accommodation to the realities of human life and need, if there isn't that, then we're not in a Christian faith posture. 
it seems to me. We're, we're deviant. <laughs> Stanley? Oh, Luke, and then Stanley? Microphone. Microphone. I'm still not clear how that's not... I mean, I, I get the sense you, you, you always want to resist the kind of move to a code and procedure, and we have to have a kind of frenetic judgment yeah. given what's before us in, 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 in modes of receptivity and certain kind of practices and cultivate forms of life and people who are, who are better able to perceive and receive the world around them in, in more or less moral ways. Yeah. Going back to what you did, the first response you, you said to, to, the, to the initial presentation, it still seems to me there's a disconnect between the individual judgment and how that can be very relativistic. It can, it can be kind of swallowed by the context. And on the other hand, this kind of norming communal um, traditions, but ultimately fluid, never stabilized yeah. processes of formation. And I, could you just elucidate a bit more how the, the norming yet fluid uh, tradition of formation, that when we stabilize it becomes a code, but so we need to keep it open somehow, connects to the individual frenetic judgment given what's before them. And that, it, it, that, that seems yeah. not quite clear how those two connecting. Well, how they're connected with, I mean, de facto in history is that we're, we're obviously brought up in a community or some kind of yeah, association which has a way of practicing what's very important to us. And then what you, it's just like we're brought up in a language, right? And then you have people have an experience where they feel that they want to make shift, I mean, introduce a new concept, or introduce a new way of, of helping people, right, that didn't exist before. <clears throat> and the issue is, is that a good move? Is that a right move in the light of what we've been trying to do all along? Right? And so what would, I mean, a, a criterion of what would have to be, what would have to be a criterion for excessive conformity to the secular? would be to make a negative move, a bad move, or move away from really unifying the gospel right? uh, in, in the interest of conforming to certain people. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, when the German Christians under Hitler uh, were making such a negative accommodationist move. But what I would like the argument to be about is, in the light of the gospel, is it a positive or a negative move? Not on some view of what is absolutely going to be unchanging, whether it's changed that. See? And I think that when, you've, when you put the question on that other issue, I have a view of what is absolutely unchanging, that, not, that the, you know, must always be vehicle, by, and that is different. You haven't made it to my view, or, I mean, one hasn't made a relevant move to the issue. Are we to make this change or not? Yeah. I mean, this, this seems to me you're, you're positing at a certain point the gospel yeah. uh, or a sacred text yeah. or some kind of stable anchor point, which goes back to Thomas' point about there's a transcendent reference outside of time and space which gets mobilized in certain ways. But, I'm, but at the same time, you want also want to say as soon as we try and stabilize it, it becomes a code and becomes a procedure and a technique. And that, that you kind of want to have your cake and eat it at that point. How, what, what's the relationship between the gospel or some kind of sacred transcendent reference, which we're always referring back to for a resource yeah. more, and the ongoing reformation of our very sense of what that is? Can, can we really have a reformation of a sense of what that sacred moment, text, event is without fundamentally changing what that thing is? Well, it's because, I mean, I think that it's not having cake and eating it, but it's being, there's a big dilemma here. There's a big issue here that we always have to face. Are we, are we denaturing it by moving it in this way or, or not? And what we, we do is we go back to, I mean, people, the way people actually work, we go back to deep source images. I mean, it can be the, 
the notion of the canotic God. It can be some pictures in our mind from the New Testament, from reaching out. It can be a great parable like, you know, Matthew 25. Uh, yeah, there are these reference points, but they need to be interpreters, right? And so, okay, what we're doing all the time is we're living in interpretation. Obviously, we wouldn't have these practices if we weren't living in interpretation. And we're, at, we're up against a certain experience in our world, which raises the question, is that a good way of really living? Is that a faithful way of living? Is that really continuing that, or is that denaturing that? I don't see how this question can be, cannot Im impinge. I mean, uh, see? No, I'm not, I'm not thinking. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't see a way of, <laughs> we're conceiving our situation in which this question cannot impinge. Now, now, of course, the argument for and against this proposed change will not be, I think I get one point you're making there, which I'm, I agree with you it will probably not be made on the basis of a totally agreed, unquestionable image, right? That, uh, no, so we're also arguing about whether something where, which we think is deeper in the tradition, more fundamental to the tradition, is being neglected by not, not changing or by changing and so on. But I don't see that, I mean, if the history of the church is not comprehensible without, <laughs> without this kind of, dialectic going on, and uh, the issue, I think, ought to be what is real, really, fidelity here, if you want to put it that way, too. Now, I don't see how one can really slide away from that. And the, actually, Christian history, particularly modern history, is so full of examples where at one point, people were sure there's no change in history, and then we now see that that was that was so. That um, yeah. Stanley, Th this Sunday is Christ the King, and uh, uh, Matthew 25 is the text, yeah. which is a very interesting juxtaposition. That what it means for Christ to be King is to feed the hungry. Yeah. Um, uh, I. I want to try to get to the sources of normativity too, this way. Um, I, I'm, I've always been curious how you understand the relationship between explanation of behavior and what you do in the first part of sources of the self. Because I take it that there is close philosophical issues involved in terms of the, uh, of the necessity of the self being narratable. Mm -hmm. And yet I don't, I don't, and so one of the things that I've always thought you've tried to help us do is to discover what narratives possess us. And, but the discovery of what narratives possess us in terms of whether our behavior is intelligible um, depends upon a narrative that allows for the kind of articulacy that you, you, you um, um, have such a stake in. What I want to know is what narrative help you discover what narratives you're part of that are, that are, uh, that are uh, possessing your life. Because I take it that you've got a real stake in some story that gives us not only a diagnostic, but a way to go on. Mm -hmm. So you want to know what narrative, but you're talking about not my personal narrative, the narrative of our whole history and the whole history yeah. of Christian church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm uh, going to be <laughs> very uh, maybe impressionistic and uh, close to inarticulacy in trying to express this, but it's that um, we the whole of Christian life lived throughout history and across all the civilizations and societies in which it's been lived is, in certain sense, aimed at drawing together the like Omega point, which is in the communion of saints, if you like. Now, 
there are big differences in the way the faith has been lived in different periods of history, in different societies at different times. And some of these are better and worse, wrong or right, but some of these are just different. And <clears throat> in a sense, we have to ask ourselves how, you know, we have to make a hazard a guess, uh, a bet, an uh, act of faith, of how we live, living today, could contribute to that Omega point. So I think that what we need for this is what we, we benefit from, if that's what we want, is a greater understanding, sympathetic understanding of some of these different, very different contexts and what Christian life has meant, and so on. And I think that's what was, <clears throat> that's my view of what I think was posited in, for instance, the move of the theologians who prepared Vatican II, Congal, you do back in others, they went back to the fathers. Uh, they didn't simply put themselves in the stream of time. They were there and say, are we being modernist or not modernist or not modern enough or too modernist and so on. They tried to get a deeper sense of <clears throat> what, what, we're, what the whole of human life is aiming at in order to see more clearly, discern the signs of the time. I use the language of Vatican. And that's a really crucial, has to be a crucial issue. For us. Does it have to affect who your conversation partners are? For example, yeah. um, it's interesting that Karl Marx doesn't come up very much. Yeah. He's merely a Yeah, that's true. I mean, the uh, we're not jumping on to the, <laughs> the secular age, I hope you don't mind. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a very, very uh, partial work. If you, uh, can I move on to that, or is that or is this sure. premature? Okay. <clears throat> that's a very partial, very unsatisfactory uh, work because in order to do that job that I set myself really well, somebody who could do that job really well, would have much more varied knowledge of many more of the sub-traditions, local traditions, so on, and make up. Even the target, the target uh, to be explained here, or to be talked about here, which was Latin Christendom and, and what's issued from it. And I, so, but I had a choice of working till the end of my days and passing this on to 10 successors <laughs> who would work in the same way. A book coming out maybe in 2015, uh, which would be thick like this that nobody would read, or to publish the book and <laughs> publish and be done and send, publish the book and then have a series of discussions that I've had with people since to show me why, how it could be improved and so on. So the book just reflects my very parochial experience. I was brought up in Quebec. What I'm inside really is the spirituality of, of the Grand Siècle, of the 17th century in France. So Saint-François de Sales is part of what I was brought up in, right? And then, of course, I could look across the border and see this large republic and a lot of, you know, Anglophones hanging around my world too, so I have some sense of what happened in the UK. And, and then I became very excited by German romanticism, so I have some, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there's lots beyond that. And I've been, people have been telling me, why didn't you? you know. I mean, Calvin doesn't come in for a lot of, um, but going back, Calvin doesn't come in for a lot of space, airtime, or whatever, and not always positively. And so, on. and I, I agree that there's certain reactions which are formed by that. But I thought it was worth throwing this book out and having having a discussion. So, there, in other words, the parochialness of that book is not based on my having weighed it all and said, "Wow, that's not worth it. That's not worth it." <laughs> no. It's based on my having to, you know, I think les moyens du bord, we say in French, but the, you know, the means I have on, on board ship <clears throat> to cobble something together. Let, let, let me just build on yeah. these comments and sort of try to summarize it. That we live in narrative communities. Yeah. And I think one of the questions is, 
how are those how do those have any stability at all right so that we don't all just become hedonic seekers of our own momentary happiness as Nietzsche and last man and what so what are the limits of those communities how do they stabilize and sure they encounter each other and in a globalizing world all the time yeah. how do they sustain themselves yeah. so I think that's you know with respect to that and then with respect to the Christian tradition how how is it that a particular view of what Christianity sustains itself and says this is orthodox and that's heterodox yeah. well how do we do that is we're doing it right now right? we're doing having this discussion about what is uh, is to be carry on the Christian life in in our time where you know this is how how we do it, and we may not succeed very much. We never succeed in the sense of getting total unanimity, but we hope that out of the exchange, anyway, comes some kind of sense of how to go forward, and then we try it out, and it may fall on its face. So we, it's that way that we don't sink into each one our own monadic bubble, and, and, and this is what I'm but all it, for. I so mean, if I went, but so if I went back to the sources of the self, yeah. You're making an argument then for a more porous self as opposed to a buffered self. Well, no, not really, because I, that, that word porous and, and buffered, I meant in a more a narrower sense than it's been taken, though it's interesting that it might be useful. I mean, the, the porous self is really talking about the self in the relation to the world of spirits and forces and so on, which we have no, you know, in. Weber's sense, we're all unmusikalisch about that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, tone deaf about that, um, no, most of us tone deaf about that. Today. And so, so I, I wanted to bring that in because I wanted to, to us to see why the, how the move of the last five centuries is very heavily determined by that change in sensibility, <clears throat> which I don't think is uh, unambiguously positive. I mean, I think there's lots of things we've lost in all that, but so, that's not really, um, I, mean, I don't think that's a way of, of getting the point, but so good. Well, the, one, one way to think about that is yeah. individual and community. Yeah. And you, you clearly are put in the camp of, communitar of, of communitarianism. On the other hand, you're in, I think in this discussion, you're raising lots of doubts about the, 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 the sustaining of communities yeah. and, in, you know, um, and the interaction of communities, and it, so would you, would you, where would you put this, I mean, if I'm thinking about, go back to sources of the self, I'm thinking about the self that you're recommending for us. Mm -hmm. Is it something other than both the buffered self and the porous self, and if so, what, what is it? Well, no, it's, uh, I mean, let's just take it as a buffered self, because in the okay, original sure. sense, that's mm -hmm. what we sure. all got into, though I think that we owe it to ourselves in a variety of reasons to try to recover what was behind these earlier experiences, but let's leave that out for a minute. Okay, so we are in these communities, which are more and more intermingled, which more and more have to live together, which are more and more interspersed. You know, and <clears throat> we have to, community something has to be constantly rebuilt. But we're not living in, or therefore rebuilding, a single, none of us, a single community. See, I think that that is another big difference of our age from, let's say, 19th century Scandinavia or whatever. All right, I mean, let's take the most united confessional state up to the 19th century, where everybody, being a citizen, under this king, the same church, the same sense of civilization, the same ethics. We're not living, impossible to live in that kind of situation anymore. And this was never possible for people in India or <clears throat> so on who already had this kind of pluralism. But we're condemned to pluralism. So we're trying to sustain and rebuild a democratic society. We're trying to sustain and rebuild our, our churches. We're trying to sustain and rebuild various kinds of <clears throat> communities, and they're all moving around and among each other. And on, uh, another demand, we have to live together in a human way with people from other such communities. So, okay. so that, how do we do this? Well, we do this by extensive, open, honest, I mean, when it works, open, honest, uh, respectful exchange. And 
that is something we may easily fail to do, and it's very much, in some ways, harder than just having one kind of community, right? So all the interlocutors are going to be Scandinavian Lutherans, so all the interlocutors. No? <clears throat> no, we're just never going to be lived in that kind of world again. But the, the way of, of doing this is within each of these communities to try to help discern with everyone else what their most, you know, best and most uh, authentic realization is, it seems to me. So that means what exactly? You don't talk. That, I mean, what, what exact alternative course of action are you proposing, which is going to obviate that in the 21st century America? Well, I obviously want to be able to practice the Christian faith. Well, that's the only way. Yeah, but I mean, you say we get people who say, that's my opinion. And that's not satisfactory for you. It's not satisfactory for me. I, I would want to say that without having to add. That's my opinion. But, yeah. Yeah. Is that really so? I mean, that. You can't, in this kind of world where some people are saying that, you can't articulate a strong conviction and even get it across as a strong conviction. Would it, would just because, you know. Would it be better to say, um, uh, I, be I believe that Christ is my savior and you're going to burn in hell? If you don't believe that? I mean, that's, I mean, that, that, I mean, that's to make it extreme. I mean, that would not be, I mean, that wouldn't be just my conviction. I'd be convinced of that. Yeah, right. I mean, right. Yeah. Right, 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 right. No, but then, but then I want to put the, Michael's point in an in, in interrogative voice to you. What, um, how do you obviate there being people like that, except one by one convincing them that they should take a stronger stance? I mean, Obviously that's one. Yeah, that's yeah, one. yeah. So then, you know, see, I, I think that I sometimes feel I that. Yeah. <laughs> I sometimes think that the response to my work is shooting the messenger. In other words, I'm saying that we're living in the kind of world in which the likelihood of such people is increased. Right? And okay, but I, you know, and what do we do in that world? Let's start from the fact that we're in that kind of world and see what, what to do. And sometimes the re rejection is, isn't that terrible? as though <laughs> I produced it. But you know, <clears throat> the question is, what's it like? And how to speak to it? I'm very sure what it's like. Michael and then Thomas. Um, so my question goes back to something you just recently said in response to Michael, which is you explained your vision of how we ought to go about yeah. um, our lives, which is encountering others and other ways of life and seeing what's best in them. And my question about this is, um, related to some of the earliest questions in our discussion, hasn't that kicked the proceduralist can down the road a little bit? In other words, how is it that we identify what's best as opposed to what's worst in you know, these alternative ways of life we're, in, we're encountering? Because it seems you can't, we can't rely on people just knowing it when they see it, right? Because certainly people have seen ways of life and not had disagreements about the factual matter of the way they live, but come to very different conclusions about it. And without some sort of procedure, it seems every time you do this, you, you sort of, you may consume a poison pill or, you know, um, you take your soul and you're, you're, you're gambling with your soul every time you do this. If you go into it without some sort of procedure for identifying the best and the worst. So I was wondering, you know, sort of how you would respond to that. Well, how we respond to that is, I don't think there is such a procedure. That's the point. I mean, the, unless you weaken procedure to the to becoming like 
you know, look at the reality and so on. There isn't such a procedure. And if you think there is, you're fooling yourself and you're not spending time doing other kinds of things that might help you get it as right as you can get it, like examining you know, people around you in your own life. I mean, my point is not that uh, is it a good idea to try to settle it by a procedure in abstracto or by another kind of looking, and if we were up in, uh, in Alpha Centauri looking at without any idea of what kind of <laughs> beings were involved here, and we had to design it, you say, yeah, let's design a procedure so they can get it through this. But, you know, we're in a situation where, as I, my claim is, there isn't such a procedure. And the people who are proposing it are fooling themselves that they can really answer this. And therefore, they're sticking at various points and not accepting certain things. I mean, like, you know, uh, only a rationality can solve this, right? And all this religious stuff is irrational. So forget that. Let's just do, you know, they they get themselves into this kind of little internal mental ghetto as a result of believing in their procedure, which incapacitates them from actually seeing certain things, which should be the only way that they can get as close as they can get to the right answer. You see what I mean? So it's not, it's not that I think it's a good thing that the universe is such that you, you don't have a procedure, but, you know, it is, uh, I believe it, that that's the way we are. Yeah, if I, if I can just clarify yeah. it a little bit, it's, you know, anyone who's, you know, raised kids knows the expression, you know, that, that friend of yours is a bad influence, yeah. right? And so the, the, the question I'm asking you is, is how to deal with the danger. So say there is no procedure, well, how to deal with the danger of encountering ways of life that, that have nothing but, but yeah. bad to offer us, or which might mislead us rather than sort of um, edify us in, yeah. as we expect, you know. Certainly if you encounter a, a gang or something, you're not going to look at them and say, well, what can I learn about? Yeah. Or you're probably not going to say, what yeah. can I learn about the good life? And how are, how are they going to change my opinion of this? Yeah. And it seems that, that part of the, the general pushback to, to your view might be, well, you know, lots of people view, you know, the alternatives to their way of life much in the way we would view a gang. And, and what, is, what is the criterion, not the procedure, but what is the criterion for distinguishing between those things and therefore what's, what's good that we can take and how we should discriminate between that and the bad we should leave? Yeah. I mean, it follows from what I think that I couldn't give you any answer that would be simply procedural. I could simply give you an answer of what I think is really good in life. I mean, okay, you're talking about a situation, let's put it in a different context. You're bringing up kids, right? And they're going to go out in the world and they're going to meet a lot of really terrible things. And I hope, I hope we're succeeding in communicating to them something which is authentically good in their eyes, which would also help them to see that this is a bad way go that's and then they go at the door I mean, you know you can't arm them any other way except living living well and communicating it but, but you would you wouldn't want them to say something like Pascal says which is what can the death of 300 Spartans mean to me yeah, I, yeah you wouldn't want them to say that yeah. no. Thomas yeah. oh, and then over here. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I wanted to come back a little bit to this um, question of normativity, but from a somewhat different angle. Yesterday, you used the, in, in sort of in passing, you made reference to the pre uh, preamble to the German or then West German constitution, uh, die Würde des Menschen ist unantastbar, the dignity of human beings is inviolable. Well, um, I'm going to elaborate just a little bit to, to clinch what I think is an important sort of and perplexing aspect of that. Uh, so here we have, uh, at the moment of extraordinary sort of you know, uh, historical disaster, uh, an attempt to recover some sense of moral uh, stability yeah. and, and non-negotiable ethical uh, frameworks. Mm. Um, the way it was phrased, however, was already a, a compromise. It was a rather sort of threading the needle. They didn't say as perhaps they might have, uh, die Würde des Menschen 
darf unter keinen Umständen angetastet werden. Under no circumstances whatsoever is human dignity to be violated. They said it cannot be. Now, on the face of it, the last 12 years had amply de demonstrated that it very well can be on a monumental and horrific scale. Why did they do this? Why did they not formulate it in this much more strident way? Because there was at that point also a decision already that had been in a way made. The whole conversation about how to frame this new society was framed as a fundamentally non-confessional secular society. And so had they phrased it the other way, they would have had to produce a warrant for the statement. Instead, they chose the weaker formula, unantaspa, which in some sense is really a strikingly counterfactual statement. And now the point to which I appeal, uh, to which I now want to bring this is the following. Here you have a society clearly struggling to reinvent itself and to make a new beginning and at the same time trying to make it without overt appeal to sort of a religious, theological traditions. Um, my impression of some of the statements, including your earlier response to my question, is that you seem to have a very, you said I had a very static notion of practice. I think you might have a little bit of a static notion of tradition. Oh, yeah. Um, in my sense is rather that that so coming out of this sort of conception of tradition as you see developed in Newman uh, in say in the ressourcement theology Yves Congar's book on, on tradition as you see it in um, Gadamer most especially perhaps or someone even so sort of a staunch Anglican like T.S. Eliot that tradition in fact is itself moving and dynamic I would certainly think that that would have potentially enabled uh, and still in, the, in different but sort of structurally analogous contexts would enable a society to appeal to tradition without thinking that it is somehow committing to fossilized notions. Yeah. Um, and so that there is always a great deal of phronesis that goes into the hermeneutic act visited upon a tradition, but that in that act itself or these activities leave the tradition also them itself uh, rendered more acutely relevant and to some extent altered. So I, I thought that uh, you, you, the, the straw man that tends to come up in these conversations is invariably the magisterium in Rome, which of course has, has blundered in, in many ways uh, throughout history by trying perhaps to have a very strong stranglehold on notions of tradition. But normativity, I think, is something that is impossible, in my view, to articulate independent of some tradition. When you said how, uh, no, here we are, we're having a conversation, part of what enables us to have that conversation is that we in fact share in certain intellectual traditions. We couldn't have it very well otherwise. So I would sort of simply want to urge uh, this sort of more fluid and, and in some sense indispensable concept of tradition as, as part of how we acquire sort of hermeneutic and phronetic orientation. I entirely agree with every word you've just said. So how did we get off on this? <laughs> I mean, how did I misunderstand well, you? Well, one reason why I'm sort of urging all these is, is that I sometimes wonder whether your account of where we find ourselves today would at any point accept that there are certain things that are in fact non-negotiable. Because the weak formula that they used in 1949 just came back to roost two weeks ago when they had a debate in the Bundestag about assisted suicide. Yeah. And, and it was you know, a very interesting debate. And, and as you know, the European commun community has, a, uh, you, uh, has an extraordinary bandwidth of, of legal yeah. approaches to that issue, for example. So there's, a, there's, I think, a classic case of a political entity, so-called, that in, f in some of its practices exhibits uh, not just divergent practices, but strikingly disparate modes of reasoning giving rise to these practices. Mm -hmm. Legal reasoning, no less than ethical reasoning. I think that is itself, in the long run, bound to be a problem for a, communion, a community of, of states and nations. Absolutely, yeah. These are dilemmas that we're facing all the time. We're halfway through. We're going to take a 10-minute break.
<laughs> uh, there, there are drinks and yeah. snacks outside. Please help yourselves, and then we will come back and talk more about a secular age. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, the second session uh, today is going to really focus on a sources, sources of the self, and, and the graduate student who's uh, going to begin our discussion is Ben Dillon. Good afternoon. Uh, first, thanks again to Professor Taylor on behalf of all of us for joining us for a few days to talk about his work. Uh, second, thanks to Luke for asking me to say a few words about the book, A Secular Age. I've read through the book a few times since his publication in 2007, but Luke's invitation forced me to read it again, this time in the span of just a few days. Uh, and under these constraints, I noticed things about Taylor's argument and his narrative that I'd missed on previous readings. And I have once more learned much from the book, so for that, I'm grateful. How does one introduce a book like A Secular Age? The book itself is around 884 pages. It's informed by several decades of work in philosophy, history, political science, and is rooted in literatures spanning many centuries, several languages, and multiple scholarly disciplines. Furthermore, it has garnered careful scholarly attention since its publication seven years ago, and not merely the sort of flash in the pan attention that we academics tend to give to any new big book that appears on the shelves, Rather, attention to Taylor's narrative and its implications appear to be growing. Uh, this year alone, uh, three volumes within my field of theology uh, have been written on the book. It seems that what we needed were seven years to process, read, reread, and process once more this complex set of narratives and arguments that has been offered to us. No doubt many of us will still be grappling with them seven years from now. What then is there to say here about the book in just a few minutes? My remarks will come in three parts. First, I'll describe the basic question the book raises and some important features of its method. Second, and very briefly, I'll provide an overview of just one strand of the book's sweeping argument. In both of these parts, I'll pay special attention to the lexicon Taylor uses. And finally, I'll raise two questions to Professor Taylor about the book. In the year 1500, Disbelief in God was almost impossible in the Latin West. Today, it is a live option for all of us. Indeed, one of the defining features of the modern West is the persistent appeal of disbelief in God. Hence the title of Taylor's book, A Secular Age. But what happened in the intervening 500 years to affect this change? That's the central question that motivates the book. And this is a question that has primarily to do with the conditions of belief in the modern West, and specifically now in the early 21st century. What does it mean for us in 2014 either to believe or to disbelieve in God or in some other reality that transcends our ordinary reality? The first term in the book's lexicon I'll note then is the West. It's a vague term, of course, and a loaded one, tied up as it is with imperialism, colonialism, and ethnocentrism. And Taylor's fully aware of all this. But it's an unavoidable term in discourse of secularity. And Taylor helpfully stipulates what he means, which is simply those societies that have emerged from Latin Christendom, uh, most of all the North Atlantic world. So this term, uh, secularity, then, is intricately related to both the West and to modernity. For the purposes of Taylor's account, the modern West is that place where secularity has emerged as a defining condition. And the secular is likewise a phenomenon properly at home here in the West. A primary purpose of Taylor's book, then, is to intervene in a conversation about secularization, which is typically, typically grounded in what gets called the secularization thesis. Of course, one point of Taylor's book is that the secularization thesis is complex, controversial, and highly contested. Stated as simply and non-controversially as possible, this thesis states that the modern West has become so thoroughly secularized that public space for religious discourse practices, and norms is rapidly shrinking. This process often gets invoked by scholars, but it is rarely clear exactly what it means. Even Taylor, by the end of his book, is clear that he is dissatisfied with not just his own attempt at describing this term, but with the term itself. But it's what we have to work with, and so we do our best. Taylor rightly points out that there are thinner and wider versions of the secularity thesis, uh, and that it, in its richer forms, the secularization thesis is a three-storied affair. The ground floor represents the factual claim that religious belief and practice have declined in the West. The basement contains some explanatory hypotheses about this claim, 
And then the upper story, the second floor, makes claims about the consequent condition of religion today. Aware that the basement and the second floor are closely linked, Taylor offers in this book an account both of how we came to this condition and of what it means for religious belief today. Two general points then about Taylor's method. First is that he doesn't want analytic claims to stand on their own. This is rooted both in a deeper anthropological point about our necessarily embodied ways of knowing and of meaning making, which leads Taylor to resist an overemphasis on certain post-Reformation strands of epistemology. And here I'll use the H word again. Uh, he wants here to, instead a hermeneutic approach. But this is rooted also in a material claim about the character of our secular age. In the ways that we tend to speak of ourselves, we implicitly, if not explicitly, rely on a subtle narrative of historical progress, from naive belief to more sophisticated forms of either unbelief or a chastened kind of belief that recognizes my way of seeing things is not the only way. Thus, we need, Taylor insists, to advert a historical narrative to say who we are. And so, Taylor focuses on what he calls the social imaginary. This is the ways that people imagine their social existence, the common understanding that makes possible our common practices, and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. Taylor avoids reducing a social imaginary to a theory, because a social imaginary is more basically an unstructured and inarticulate understanding of our entire situation, within which particular features of our world show up for us in those particular ways. This, this, I take, is a more developed version of the aphorism Professor Hauerwas is fond of repeating around here. You can act only in a world you can see, and you can see only in a world you can speak. The primary target of Taylor's methodological criticism is the purveyors of what he calls the subtraction story of secularity, which suggests that we began in Latin Christendom with some nexus of beliefs and attitudes, then God was removed from that equation, and we are now left today with X minus belief in God, where X refers to whatever we had in, say, 1400. This is usually, but not always, accompanied by a secular triumphalism. Second, Taylor suggests that a generous and sympathetic account of where we are will try to look at the thickest forms of any competing way of seeing the world. As a result, Taylor's book aims to avoid closing off lines of inquiry or imposing its own narratives on others who might resist it. Instead, he offers close readings of a great number of texts, social phenomena, and historical periods. If we're to figure out how to go on in what he calls a nova situation, then we need broad exposure to the stories and perspectives of those around us who see the world as fundamentally different from how we see it. And so, uh, in just a few minor points, I'll sketch one central strand of this narrative uh, this has already come up in the discussion about sources of the self, so I'll make this even shorter than I had intended. The story goes something like this. Beginning with the Christendom of the high medieval period, uh, Taylor traces key developments in the final centuries of Latin Christendom. Certain tensions internal to Christianity, such as the tension between its un universalizing scope and its drive for reform, play out in complicated ways that lead to an explicit crisis in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. The period 1450 to 1650 is especially important to the story Taylor tells us. Uh, here, in a zigzag effect of different extremes of reaction and counter-reaction, play out in a manifestation of new forms of sociality and new ways in which people conceive of themselves. In short, the West experiences a radical and sudden change of its social imaginary. Here, the rise of the disciplinary society and the great disembedding which accompanies the replacement of the poorest self with the buffered self. This gives way to a modern moral order and an accompanying moral imaginary. Here, several concepts become definitive. The economy, the notion of an extra-political public sphere, popular sovereignty, and the direct access society. This leads us then to a modern social imaginary in which competing worldviews mutually fragilize each other. Uh, increasingly so in the current NOVA effect we experience, uh, in which we have competing forms of ways of seeing ourselves, not just in terms of religious belief or disbelief, 
but in what kind of world we are in at all. So with these remarks in mind, I have two questions for Professor Taylor. The first relates to how you understand your work and its development, and the second is a theological question. All right. So first, uh, in, the, in the first two years after Secular Ages publication, Professor Taylor engaged in several public exchanges about the book, and I'm sure countless more unpublished exchanges. One common critique that emerged from this focused on some of your central terms, and in particular, the concept of fullness, uh, and then the contrastive pair of transcendence and eminence. Mm -hmm. A fullness you deploy to get at this distinction between just living and really living. Mm -hmm. uh, and a few times you quote the lines from Porgy and Best that I love uh, to describe Methuselah. But who'd call that living when no gal will give in to no man who's 900 years? <laughs> Your critics, however, suggest that this notion already decides the question in favor of something like Christian belief. Likewise, the conceptual distinction between transcendence and imminence does a lot of work in your narrative. You suggest that it's both indispensable for the discussion because it's so central to our dominant social imaginary today, um, but also you insist that it's not absolute. So my question is, uh, in the intervening five or six years since these exchanges, uh, have you further developed any thoughts about these terms in a way that might help us read your work differently? Um, and to make the question broader, are there any major ways your mind has changed since 2007 about the story you tell? Second is a theological question. And the, uh, the description I got of this event said political theology, so I thought this would be fair game. So at the risk of being overly schematic, I find three competing models of Christian church in the narrative you tell. Mm -hmm. Each is defined by, first, its particular conception of the identity of the holy community. Mm -hmm. uh, second, the conception of uh, what that holiness consists in. And third, how that community evaluates those outside its bounds. Model number one is the traditional conception of Catholic Christianity. All those baptized, and for most of the Latin West, this was everyone in society, mm -hmm. uh, is a proper part of the, the holy community. Clearly not everyone is able to live up to the uh, rigorous demands of Christian discipleship. So a multi-track or multi-speed system emerges. This dynamic will look radically different in a secular age, uh, but I understand you to be making some kind of normative proposal for recovering that view of what Catholic ecclesiology looks like. A second model in the story uh, is defined by what you call reform. Uh, which as an impulse deep within Christianity is not limited to the Protestant Reformation, uh, but it finds its exemplification in Calvinist reform. Here, a high standard is set uh, specifically uh, for membership in the church as the holy community, but this impulse to reform exceeds those bounds uh, and spills out uh, into the, the community of, at large. So if you can't live up to discipleship, then we'll impose uh, this police state of sort on your behavior to make sure you stay within certain bounds. But third is radical reform, exemplified by the Swiss Anabaptists in which a formally identical set of demands is placed on discipleship within the community uh, as in the magisterial reform. But in this case, you explain, outsiders are simply dismissed as damned. So with these three models in mind, I have two questions for you. First, how do you conceive, and this is one that, this is a question that has already sort of been hinted at with your exchange with Professor Fow and with Luke, but how do you conceive of the relationship between Catholicity and the magisterium? If Catholic Christianity aims at accommodating as many believers as possible within its bounds, what role do you see the magisterium is playing in managing, if not policing, those boundaries? And second, um, I might point to a different way of construing that third model of radical reform. Uh, there's a particularly post-Bardian way of thinking of the Anabaptist view of church that distances itself from identifying the church as heaven-bound and the world as hell-bound, instead focusing on the church and world as epistemological categories, which, while trying to avoid uh, Rahner's imperialistic notion of the anonymous Christian, uh, makes no judgment about saved or damned but rather sees the church as those who, taking on this higher path of Christian discipleship, witnesses somehow to the broader shape that they believe God is bringing the world. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Yes. All right, so uh, what do I have? Do I have regrets about those terms? 
Yes, in a way. Well, no, I don't have regrets about fullness at all. I think it was just misunderstood, and I can't understand why people, after my Porgy and Bess uh, <clears throat> analogy, want to go on seeing it as some kind of crypto Christian. No. I mean, that in other words, I was making what I thought was an anthropological universal, okay? I mean, I go, that everybody makes some kind of distinction between, you know, that was really life and that, that it was less so. I mean, at those times when my life were, was really something living and the uh, other times were not as much so. That's one of the central distinctions people make because it, it helps them precisely orient themselves towards what they think is the, the good. I mean, it, and uh, th so why, why introduce that? Well, because um, it's illuminating to understand what different outlooks, beliefs, commitments are like if you can compare them in various ways. And one of the ways of comparing them is what's their notion of, of fullness. So I both stick by the utility of finding such a term, and I think I, you know, with a certain hesitation, I stick by that particular term. This is particularly, comparison is particularly important in a world in which, as I see ideally, we give more effort in explaining ourselves to each other, because one of the ways of communicating to people what is really what they really should learn about us, and we learn about them, is what, what is the notion of fullness? What's the notion of really full life? That, <clears throat> that, that, which is also, if you explain that to somebody, you also explain why you find your commitment, your faith, whatever, really powerful. And so that's why I, I stick by there being such a word in the analysis, and I stick by that word. I have another view of, of imminent transcendence because it obviously plays you false, but I, if I had to rewrite the book, I don't know what I'd do. It plays you false for the following reason. Quite understandable. I don't, I don't know how many people have said this to me. It depends what you're, you know, what you're transcending. Some people have extremely narrow views about only matters of their own society, and when they open up, they're transcending that. Some people have, you know, you can go on and on and on. Uh, giving cases where people are talking about going beyond some boundary and they want to invoke the word transcendent for that. I thought I could get away with this because I thought there is, there developed in Christendom this notion of the natural order and then the supernatural order, right? And I think this is, it's not untrue to say that we're still, in a way, haunted by that. And so a lot of people align themselves when they're deciding what they believe, of whether, OK, we only accept this order here, or whether we go beyond. And I introduced that in another way with the concept of the imminent frame. Right? So uh, but maybe I should have just stuck with that and not used imminent transcendent, because I don't know how many times this has been under misunderstood by unhooking it from that supernatural natural distinction. Yeah, now there's another point that you, I want to uh, take up that you said is very rightly so. I said both that this seems indispensable in people's imaginary and that it's very questionable. And I, I mean, I'm, you know, I had do do back type reasons for wondering whether you can make that neat cut between <clears throat> natural and supernatural as a correct theoretical idea. But that has nothing to, not necessarily anything to do with imaginaries. Imaginaries very often operate with distinctions that, on reflection, we want theoretically to, to reject. But I mean, the, my big failure here is that, although I was pointing to what I think is a very common imaginary, do you want to go beyond, you know, is there something beyond the natural order, et cetera? I think that it's the Refusal to many people recognize this obviously was a failure of the book. Now, what I should have done instead of that, I'm still, <laughs> I'm still working over. So the second question, yeah, I suppose that I have a, um, 
Well, I think probably I'd like your third, um, your third, or maybe I could start entirely from another place to get into the answer to that question. See, I think that one of the big, okay, this is now going to, I think I'm going to send some people maybe here into orbit. I apologize. For it. It's very heretical. I think that we've, particularly in the West, and particularly, I suppose, since the Reformation, but also before, we've been obsessed with the issue of salvation as individual. I think that a much more important issue in the Christian faith is salvation of the world, gen general salvation. And this assumption, I think, was too easy that the general thing has been more or less accomplished in those three days back then. And then the other the question is who, who conforms and gets into this and who's non-conforming and getting out of this. So we split our minds open, people outside the church, are they going to be in, you know, in heaven or hell? And I think that is uh, that forgetting of the universal salvation or placing it secondary or not giving it a place is a unfortunate deviation. Now, you know, that, let's say, or insufficient understanding of things. I don't let say deviation. Within that insufficient understanding, certain things become terribly important to decide. How to understand that, it, uh, the, how the world is coming closer to God, and I think that that is something we don't really understand, but if it can be got a handle on it at all, it is rather by, uh, I mean, my image is the mustard seed, right? What do those mustard seed mean? They are moments, acts, modes of being which really connect to God. And now, I mean, Matthew 25 is in my mind. That is a character. And what's bringing that forward? Well, things done by Malala in, in the Swat Valley are bringing it forward, although she's a Muslim. You know. Things done by even you know, in, by you know, anybody, atheist doctors who become part of mid sense influence, yeah, right. those are the mustard seeds which are bringing the kingdom on in ways that we can't understand, right? So if you think of that as, you know, because Matthew 25 doesn't say what their, you know, status is with their confessor or what their status is, he said, you know, you are hungry and which I take very seriously. So I think that, well, what is the church doing? The church is meant to be vehicling this hope, this faith, and inspiring that. And I think that in some cases, these people who are totally outside have been actually historically inspired. They wouldn't have maybe got this, <laughs> this idea. They wouldn't have gone into this action without, um, without that being so. And what are we doing on Earth? Well, we're going to make that, we hope, more so for the future, but it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not really pertinent. I mean, think, you know, I feel I'm very much, I think, I'm inspired by Francis. So don't think about um, how this fits into some scheme you have about it. These are hungry people. Feed them. Or discover what the, I mean. That's we get back to the discussion earlier. What it, what really meeting these needs amounts to, and then let, let's have a big talk about that at any given time and discuss it. But that is what is is really important. So, what's the church in all this? Oh, eschatologically, it's everybody who is brought together. Now, you know, why does it matter exactly? Okay, um, I'm stopping there, which is very theologically incorrect, I know. And so, I mean, put it down to the fact that I'm a theological illiterate, and that's also true, that I'm terribly challenged and so on. This is the la foi du charbonnier, we used to say in French, right? What's the, you know, the, the faith of the simple <laughs> peasant? Well, yeah, or the, you know, c'est la foi du charbonnier qui parle at this point, and... Uh, <laughs> Questions? Uh-huh, Don. Yeah, I've been trying to um, sort of grasp wait, wait. 
since since the since the first session, I've been trying to corral a sort of set of unruly interrogative impulses which <laughs> into some sort of coherent question or comment. And I guess uh, I'll start with, um, you know, we've been talking about um, various traditions, particularly the tradition of, of Christianity, and the West as being a set of societies that emerged from modern Christendom. Yeah. Um, but of course, as you say, we live in a world with other traditions and that had their origins in other places um, and have been de you know and have gone on to to develop into modern societies of various kinds um, and, and it seems to me that um, all of these different traditions you know religion religious traditions major religious traditions uh, look back in time to some set of, of or involve reference to some sort of set of texts um, uh, some and or defining moments of experience of the experience of the community, certain key events like the Passover and Judaism, um, and and things like that, and and that this is the sort of the source of, or the people in this tradition look back yeah. to these things as the source of the, the what they return to over and over again in their efforts to grapple with the the tasks that you are mentioning, you know, about encountering other peoples. Mm -hmm. Uh, while still maintaining the integrity of your tradition in some way, looking back to the tradition, to the sort, to these sources, and trying to uh, answer questions about how can we modify or should we modify, you know, to f in the face of realities, these kinds of things. Um, so, and all of these very it seems like these major traditions originated, you know, around roughly around in, in a similar period of time. Some people have called it the axial age, whatever. Anyway, and and that, but. Of course, human beings were cultural, social cultural beings, and, pr and also religious beings for a long time before that. Um, um, and so I'm trying to think about, you know, it seemed like it was a, 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 one of the questions sort of re recurring in here is the, is the question of, of what are the sources of, of normativity, that is, your vision of the good against which you measure and, and attempt to answer various kinds of questions. Um, and it seems like in, in, in certainly in Christianity and in these other traditions, you, you know, you look back, you always go back to this in some way and, and, and possibly, you know, there's a tradition of commentary on the texts um, in, the, in the Catholic Church. There's also a tradition of saints, you know, which I, I see as recognition of, of lives who, you know, in a naturalistic framework, you know, they're, they're somehow exemplary four aspects of this tradition. And so you, you consult these things when you're faced with dilemmas, you know, and you have, uh, in any case. So I'm, I'm trying to th imagine, you know, suppose you see yourself standing in the present moment and looking not only back mm -hmm. two or 3,000 years, but forward two or 3,000 years, <laughs> yeah. A and think about, you know, do you think that um, it's possible you know, f to, to, to see human life within a framework in which these kinds of, th the sorts of traditions that are embodied in these various ways against which people, that articulate this vision of a good life and good society and against which people measure their decisions and shape their lives um, as somehow possible outside of, a re of, of what has been traditionally a religious tradition but not maybe outside a religious tradition in the broadest sense. Here I'm thinking of Geertz's um, idea of, 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 of religion embodying a set of sacred symbols. And these symbols, what they do is they unify, they somehow integrate and unify the ethos and the worldview. There's our understanding of the natural world and how we think about we ought to live, the, the vision of the good. And that it's not about God or any sort of theistic or supernatural sort of source in this, as I see it, anyway. So could you imagine, you know, the, the possibility that humans would, at some point in the far distant future, be able to find sources for this kind of good, which, which would be religious in that sense, and it might be compelling, and might be embodied in various kinds of, um, I don't know, uh, you know, um, Traditions of, uh, of, of discourse, commenting on it, rituals in which you enact certain things which are somehow 
provide you with insight into what you think is the essential good. Um, you know, it's sort of an aesthetic dimension, which is, you know, which is deeply uh, compelling in ways that discourse can't be, um, and various things like that. And uh, that it would be religious in that sense. So the, al the alternative to a contemporary sort of a religious standpoint within standing within a tradition would not be what Kitcher calls militant modern atheism, but something else, which would in some sense be religious, but wouldn't be theistic. I don't know if that makes sense. Sure, I mean, uh, of course. Uh, Ronnie Dworkin was already talking about the religion of the thought. I mean, that, uh, that's a possibility. I mean, I think not only can I imagine that, I think it's happening. I think it's happening as part of the process that I try to call the NOVA. I mean, that people are constantly you know, working out new, new positions, and that's probably, I'm not looking for <laughs> 2,000 years, but, but uh, you know, in the present age, we seem to be moving into pluralism of that kind, and that would be one, one of the kinds, right? That that would replace uh, the religions that we know seems to me to be highly uh, improbable. And then the question of where I want to stand, I don't see that kind of power. Power which could, but see, then I see it within very much within the Christian framework that I've tried to describe. This kind of yeah, transformative action, agape. And um, so, but I think that that is going to be one voice among many, one path among many. And not only de facto, but we're going to be all in many parts of the world mixed up together. I mean, take any large globalizing city today, and you have you know, just thousands of things, including ones that nobody could imagine. Like there's one that was. A, it's, it is, exists today, it's a kind of amalgam of Afro-Brazilian religion in the east of the country, transplanted to the Amazonia with a, and another kind of, of fusion with an Amazonian religion, and it has most of its adepts in Japan. That's, okay, get your mind around that. That's globalization. That's part of our our future. So that is going to be the predicament in which Christian charisma is going to be heard or not heard. But I don't see that. Uh, that's not that kind of. It's not kind of religion you're talking about yet. It's, it's something different again, right? Because it's got, it's got. It's as it were they've they've taken certain very powerful ritual traditions, both from Yoruba religion and later from Amazonian religion. But there's a kind of axial dimension. There's an idea of spiritual growth. There's an idea of communion, which, in, which as it were, promotes the spiritual growth, so, which brings in this kind of axial, axial dimension. And this is what's happening in a lot of globalized cities in the world, that you get this kind of, that they're, to some extent, affecting each other. But what is striking is the tremendous pluralism of the situation. So I, I do. Th just, I mean, in this, you know, very simply abstracting from, uh, I mean, projecting, or what, what's the word? Pro, you know, what do you call it? Uh, extrapolating, or yeah. that's what I'm looking for, from our present predicament. I think this is going to go on and, and increase. But, I, but there will never be a world religion without God. I mean, never, uh, you know, there'll never be, are all coming together. Let me remind you if you want to, if you have questions, please raise your hand so I can write your name down. Yeah, let, let me just build a little bit on this and ask a, a question about the secular age itself and whether and to what extent it could be understood still as a Christian yeah. age. And, and I'm thinking here when you talk about radical reform, the radical reformation, people, especially Servetus, the anti Trinitarians, the Unitarians, who become what you call deists. Uh, uh, eventually, but w whether or not there isn't a kind of necessary path that that requires them to sustain a whole lot of Christian belief and to put to put it in different places. For example, human rights. Yeah. Right. We still, even today, though we're not Kantians, people generally tend to treat human life as sacred. Mm 
in some sense, and we and we take killing to be sacred. So even without an explicit Christ being the center of religion, and Christ is continually diminished within that whole anti-Trinitarian message, they don't still retain lots of the Christian moral teachings that make it. And and so in that way, the secular age is really not the age, the age of the atheist. It's the age of the radical Protestant, uh, and and therefore seen by Catholics often as an, a heterodox or orthodox or atheist age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right, right. So th and that's another way of saying that the original impact of the gospel flips outside the boundaries of the orthodox whatever you call it, church, however you draw that, it begins to move things outside, sometimes in ways that turn bad and sometimes in ways that are obviously good. I mean, obviously part of these, of these mustard seeds. And how it works is so hard for us to understand. And it's presumptuous for us to think understand so we just have to be able to recognize those and move with them and try to promote them and try to be the kind of church that uh, feel back to them. the kind of good things that are happening in human rights are the good fruit of being that church throughout all those centuries right now we want to be the church through this in the following centuries and it should be that Doing that, we're promoting spillover goods in the 27th. You know, see what I mean? That's the although, although, that's the goal. Although many many devout Christians would characterize Unitarians, even or anti-Trinitarians, in any case, as not falling within the church. Right? No, They're not no, part of the community. No. <clears throat> right. Okay. I mean, people are going to have different views about that, and it's very important. These views are very important when we talk about our communal life and our particularly sacramental life, within, which has happened within recognized boundaries and communities. And I'm not saying that the present ones are always acceptable. I mean, not being, for me, not being able to intercommunicate with Orthodox and Anglicans is a real problem. Uh, but, so that's very important for that reason, but it's not important for issues of I mean, salvation is not, not necessarily important as God, the Spirit bloweth where it listeth, and it's not important for judging whether these are really mustard seeds of the ultimate kingdom, mm -hmm. which that, the discernment, is you know, what's being done, what's happening. Okay, I have Michael first and then over here. Thank you again for being willing to come here and talk to us. Um, my question is about <clears throat> who it is that is secular. Um, and I get a sense that there are at least three discrete ways in which you use this. One way, the, the least common, is to refer to those, uh, in, even in the ancient world, as particular individuals or sects that might be regarded as non-theistic. And I'm thinking in particular of the Epicureans yeah. that you mentioned. A second group, which is very large, the largest entity, might be everyday people, most people, the mass of people, uh, those who might not be particularly reflective, uh, those who do not have to break with custom <laughs> or tradition in order to be non-believers. And in between that is a smaller group, but larger than the first, namely what we could call the elites. Um, and here I'm thinking of your comments uh, with reference to Gibbon, that he at least seems to acknowledge that a Roman elite may have paid lip service yeah. to religious beliefs without necessarily taking them seriously. My question is, when you use a term like the secular age mm -hmm. in its most comprehensive sense, is it necessarily the case that all three of those groups have to have become secularized in the sense that you use it? Is there a moment in which, uh, well, let me ask the question in a negative way. Would it have been possible for us not to be in a secular age 
had any one of those three groups all right, not become secular? And I'm thinking particularly of the, of the largest group. Yeah, but I think, you know, did Gibbon read the elite that way? Uh, I'm not sure that somebody who got his mind into that 18th century you know, distance from religion perspective probably couldn't understand the ancient Romans. I mean, that, you know, that they, he sort of thinks of them as analogous to some of the not very biased advisors to kings or kings who are manipulating the system in order you know, to uh, get the, the plebs to obey. And, you know, if you, I think, Perhaps the better anthropological understanding of the ancient world would not be that. I mean, there was that they had a genuine fear, and very often, of really transgressing and creating sacrilege of various kinds. Yeah, and they also were aware that, you know, if the, uh, you know, the famous case of the, uh, the admiral who throws the chickens overboard, right? Chickens are supposed to, if they eat the stuff, it's supposed to mean we're going to win. And, and he said, if they will not eat, let them drink, he threw them overboard. And the Romans lost the battle. <laughs> but I mean, that, that is taken by kind of the Gibbonian view as kind of saying what most elites have felt. I mean, this is, this is maybe a side, a side argument. That's not going to that. I really, I severely doubt that. I mean, there are, in the, in the, in the, uh, in the pre disenchanted world, there was a real fear of, of sacrilege. Of, getting the gods against you and so on, even if you didn't, you know. Uh, <clears throat> so, but, um, yeah, I think it, uh, everything contributed in the end to the modern secularization, including a recovery of Epicureanism, of Lucretius, and so on. Uh, but it's very important to then look at the word secular, because it's a Christian word, and so you get the modern secular world, even by being a very secular thing in the modern secular world, is a, a twist on an original dyad, which is thought to be an, what I call an inseparable dyad, like up and down are inseparable dyads. You can't have up without down, right? Left without right. That you, there was this dimension of how we were proceeding in the here and now and so on, and then there was a dimension in which we were moving towards eternity and these two dimensions were the dimension of the higher, of the spiritual, uh, on one hand, and the secular. Which is why, you see, we have a, it's a time word. It's very interesting that the word for this godless or, or impious word is a time word. Right? This is something that we don't reflect on enough. And it comes a twist in that where there comes to be the belief that we can, this can be a, external dyad, that is, you can have one without the other, and you can kind of just have the secular world. Well, that, getting by that route is, um, is to have something very different from whatever sort of <laughs> secretly unbelieving <laughs> Roman emperor or consul might have been, or the first category, of, or even the Epicureans, see, because it's not, there is, um, it's all bound up with a notion of an order, a natural order in which we can dominate and <clears throat> shape and make the act activism of the modern secular is really absent from the Lucretian outlook, which is much more, we want to have this outlook because we want to have ataraxia and not be troubled by the, <clears throat> by the gods and so on and to sink into the, I mean, be part of this great uh, natural sort of natural movement and so on. So it's something, see, all in all these ways, the modern secular is, unless you define it simply as not believing in a transcendent God, right? unless you define it that way, it's something very, very different. So it's, um, it's hard to discuss it if you just take what it has in common with. You know, there were atheists, there always were, you know, or even, the people that uh, had various kind of atheistic beliefs in that great, another axial, great axial epoch is the epoch of all the renouncers, out of which Buddha emerges as the most important figure for us, right? But there were all sorts of others, Jains and others, and there were, there were various kinds of atheists at that time, and there was just 
anything you can think of, there was some minority of people who were who were proposing it and sort of rivalry and disputes, et cetera, et cetera. Talk about, you know, the, from the fifth, fourth, third century BCE, right? So again, it's it's not in those kind of atheists that existed there. It's not just that everybody has fallen into that. We have a very, very different way of grasping the world to be secular today, which actually straddles is in common in many respects between believers and unbelievers today. We share this kind of imminent, what I call imminent frame, which is very much the idea of an activist remaking the world frame, for better or for worse. I mean, we may wreck the boat and the bus in the process. See? So for all those reasons, maybe I'm sounding like a typical uh, philosopher making uh, meaningless fine distinctions, but I think that we have to make these kind of distinctions and see secularity in its full semantic force in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Over here, question? Yeah, I want to, um, speaking about religious discourse and the secular age, I want to come back to something that, that, that was brought up a little earlier about happiness, uh, economics, and the issue of what seems to me to be a sort of a version of false consciousness style arguments where a person would sort of say, hey, you know what, I'm, max I'm trying to maximize my own happiness, this is the way I f find fulfillment, and people in this room, you know, sort of be like, ah, you know, that's too thin, and you're not really happy, you know, you don't really realize, but you know, you're missing out on something, and, and how that type of move could be very easily sort of deployed against your openness, you know, where somebody who's, you know, very seriously conservative Christian tradition could say, you know, you really think you're being open and loving by telling people there, you know, there's no real risk of damnation, but in reality, you know, there's this. So I'm wondering to what extent, you know, these sort of false, con how, how we can deal with these issues of, of sort of false, appeals to false consciousness, meaning, you know, you, the, the, the argument, the, the, the example from earlier was the case of gay marriage. You said, look, I meet these people. I know people, they, can, they have these loving relationships in this context, and so I learn from that experience. But I know, you know many people who would say something like, well, they think they're happy, they think they're finding fulfillment in this sort of relationship, but in reality, they're deceived. So I'm wondering to what extent like, those sorts of things prohibit us from doing the kind of, because you're a very nice guy, you're very open, you know? <laughs> well, you know, but I don't know to what extent we can generalize from you. Um, you know, uh, um, and, and to what extent it is that people really do, uh, on that daily basis, when you start to listen for these things, people deploy these sort of false consciousness style arguments all the time. You know, you think you're being happy, you think you've got the truth, you think this, but you know, I really know better. So I'm wondering if, whether the kind of project you're outlining is in fact really possible, or whether it just reflects really the kinds of things that I won't admit are non-negotiable for me. And so I'll seem like I'm being open until I actually hit something that you're talking about that violates that boundary for me, and then I'll say, oh, well, yeah, you think that's true, but does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, but I mean, the response <laughs> to that is the, the injunction to look and see is not fulfilled, but is shirked or shied away from by your saying, oh, it looks okay, but it's false consciousness. Like, you won't look at it. I mean, uh, if somebody wants to make that move, that's, you know, that's maybe psychologically understandable, but it's not epistemically Right, but okay, but let me let me push back against this then. So let's come back to the example. Of the, what if somebody says, you know, what, I go play golf, I play with my kids, I don't believe in God, I, I feel like I'm happy, I'm fulfilled, I don't have a crisis of meaning, I don't feel my life is impoverished or thin, you know, I feel good. <laughs> you know, life seems like it's pretty good. <laughs> well, and happy. Right, okay, right, and right, so that, so that the idea is the person doesn't feel this absence. So, I, so I'm wondering to what extent, because it seemed like the exchange here, and I, and I actually can see both sides of this, but the, so the exchange that you guys had here was sort of like, ah, you know, these people, you know, they don't get it. And I'm wondering if you're doing, you see what I'm saying, the, the very thing, you know, you're looking at them saying, ah, well, because they're taking this view, that really can't be sort of an authentic expression. Well, this, I mean, this is much more plausible than that, right? because... <laughs> This was these kind of states that were abstracted. You right. said, I'm playing golf, I'm loving my children, and I'm yeah. presumably you have a wonderful relation with your wife, your partner. No, that's totally plausible. I mean, okay, so you don't feel the dark night of the soul. Well, indeed, maybe you're missing something, but that, <laughs> but that you right. have something right. there, it can, it's 
is fully plausible. So, okay, then life is also growing old, dying, losing people, uh, and how does it stack up? And you know, the, these are. This is the kind of question that one might want to ask, or that life would force you to ask at a certain point. But it is, these are utterly different examples. You see. No. Yeah. 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 Take take something in the middle. Yeah. What what if I said what if I were a valley girl and I said to you I really like to shop, right? <laughs> Going to the mall yeah. is you know that's 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 the peak of human existence, and uh, you know especially with Daddy's credit card, uh, you know and and you know I I realize I'm going to get old someday but it's all going to be worse than this. This is the best that life has to offer. <laughs> I mean, say that when you're 40. I mean, uh, well, yeah. no, no, I, 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 get, I get that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I have David first. First, thank you uh, for coming here. And uh, uh, I've got to say, I've always uh, uh, Profited from engagement with your work. Um, uh, I want to connect maybe with what Steve was saying uh, uh, to your remark about Hume uh, near the beginning of this discussion. Uh, and, and you said that uh, Hume got the felt part right, the feeling part right, but not the perception. Uh, and indeed, many of your remarks uh, are in line with that, the, the look and see part and, and our being able to engage in dialogue with each other if we uh, try to find common points of, of, of perception uh, and, and coming against uh, realities. Um, but uh, a lot of what what's in the air now is how the felt part conditions the perception part and how it gets entangled with the perception part. Uh, so that uh, it's harder to, especially when, it, when we come up against some of our fundamental disagreements, harder to disentangle the felt part from the perception part. Uh, and, and so while deeply sympathetic to your call to be open and respectful, <laughs> uh, one can't help but be a bit pessimistic about how we are divided into islands of feeling, each with our own uh, confirming perceptions. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I also want to relate that to the, the secular age and this sense that uh, now we may not be so secular. That's, and I have in mind forms of evangelical Christianity, which uh, are now extremely powerful and uh, accumulating uh, followers. Um, and uh, I think it's in part, um, uh, they're getting something out of it, perhaps feeling <laughs> that uh, more discursive and, and, and uh, uh, dynological forms of, of, of religious tradition uh, have, have perhaps lost. Uh, and, and perhaps that is uh, partly accounts for the power of evangelical movements. Mm -hmm. But I think, again, that presents a challenge to those of us who uh, would tr like to try to understand and engage in dialogue, but uh, oftentimes confront a kind of emotional uh, wall <laughs> or some distance uh, in terms of a feeling that affects perception and, and um, dialogue, our ability to engage in dialogue. I mean, I agree with that. <laughs> it is very, very, very difficult to. Can I give a further, just a further example of that? I, I was in Jerusalem uh, several years ago, and um, I went to the Armenian church there where they had a wonderful service in the afternoon that was done by uh, most of the students who were there in the in the seminary and uh, it was the only time that wonderful churches open and uh, people come in in droves 
uh, all not noticing the signs that everywhere say no pictures, and they take pictures and then they leave. And um, the, I and two other American women st stayed through the whole service. And as we were leaving, I said to them, did they enjoy the service? And they said, well, you know, I used to be Catholic, but we don't do Latin masses like this anymore. And I thought, well, OK, it was in Armenian. They, they, they at least had the idea that the ceremony mattered. <laughs> but the ceremony really mattered to the priests, the priests, yeah. right? They weren't really mediating this to anybody else. The next day, I went to uh, the site of the supposed site of the Last Supper, and there were 300 Pentecostals who were talking in tongues, collapsing on the floor, et cetera, et cetera. And I and I left wondering whether the Christ Christianity wasn't either one thing or another a completely closed community that only belonged to the priests, or groups of people talking in ways uh, quite enthusiastically, but not understanding a word that anybody else was saying. So, so I wonder whether, I mean, and you come down in the middle for something like a discursive mm -hmm. community, but uh, this is building on David's question, lots of our communities are not necessarily based on d discourse. They're based on ritual, they're based on liturgy, or they're based on some radically individualized experience. So I'm wondering if we look at what's happening globally to Christianity with the growth, especially growth of Pentecostalism, whether or not this is likely to be discursive in the way that you would like it to be, and, and if not, what, what do you think could be done about that? Well, I don't, I mean, I didn't mean discursive uh, as against, well, excluding ritual. I meant uh, ritual and discursive. Now, there's going to be, there has been and there will be all sorts of refractions of what the Christian message is, including some that aren't, that aren't discursive. But um, in the end, there has, in order to live with others, there has to be some, some discourse. You know, changing, how, how do we live together, or do we live in totally, you know, that we can have this living in totally siloed communities, which is one of the, one of the Anabaptist sort of products was the idea of a siloed community. And we have in Canada some like that, right? Particularly in the, in the West, with a minimum contact with the, with the outside world, and of course they don't um, necessarily hold everybody right, and there's a <clears throat> certain amount of. But and and in, and in the coming world, it may be necessary to have more discourse in order to know how to <clears throat> the rules of living together with the community around them. So I think that, in a certain sense. The opportunity for discourse takes care of itself. I mean, the, that the uh, that there there are moments when it has to has to arise, and it can be that the relationship of the discourse of the community life can be ones in which within there's very little, but without there's got to be some kind of exchange, or it can be an attempt to put all these within the life of the community, which is very kind of the standard large church in the West, both Catholic and Protestant uh, mode, of, mode of living and so on, yeah. But <clears throat> I don't, you know, and look at the growth of Pentecostalism in the world, uh, Brazil, you know, it's, it's, it's bubbling up institutions to train the clergy and therefore developing into theological expressions and academic work in theology. It's um, all these different aspects of a fuller life are being <clears throat> produced out of what have maybe originally had been communities of converts simply around a pastor and so on with a great deal of, of charismatic authority. But, you know, I'm pulling favor in here, right? You know, the, the charismatic authority gets fairly I mean, you get, you know, routinized in some respects and therefore it has to carry on, et cetera. So I, I think that that, will, that relationship will take care of itself. Now, what will go into the discourse, whether it really be exchange, whether it will really be learning how to live together in some kind of harmony and mutual respect and some kind of sense of both contributing to uh, that's a big issue, but that there will be a place for discourse, for theorization, and so on. It's, I think, 
خمس So I, I was wondering, as I reviewed the book yesterday night again, uh, I didn't read all of it, but I, I tried. I um, again, I see, I see um, many, many voices informing your argument. I see sociological <coughs> arguments. I so see what they call so philosophische Anthropologie, yeah. uh, awesome. somewhat different valence in English, but but no sort of. Yeah. Uh, it's in my language too. I mean. Yeah. I, um, philosophy, obviously. Um, I see very little in the book, after all, concerned with uh, the sort of evolving place and practice of religion. I see very little theology. And one of the things I was wondering is whether there are, at this point, any theological writers, more recent or distant, who have in some significant way contributed to your conception of religion as you began to work out your argument. Yeah, I mean this. And who they are in particular. Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, autobiographically, I really got started in all this. It was before Vatican II, but uh, it's another accident <coughs> of where I come from. I come from Quebec. and. A great deal of the thinking, which eventually emerged in Vatican II, came out of French-speaking members of the Dominican and Jesuit orders, Concao, for instance, Quebec, and they had it was very intense communication across the Atlantic with the Francophone members of those orders who were all you know, going to study at the Sochois, or <clears throat> so. Um, among people that were somewhat concerned about the faith and not terribly happy with the kind of very authoritarian church that we had in Quebec at the time, the works of Concar and Duvac and others circulated, including even so sort of very young and uh, extremely ill-educated, I mean, theologically, people like, like me. And it sort of continued from there, I mean, I. Uh, it, then it, I also was to some extent influenced by, which was not, not separate from, not foreign from this influence, an influence of a certain take on Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox theology, which is vehicle, I mean, you know, uh, and other people that I read, and, you know, Beb Jayef and some Gokov, and, so, and then as time, I mean, I'm recently I find a great deal of affinity with certain elements of British radical orthodoxy. Um, I could probably go on if I thought more and more and more, but you know, I have never made, as you probably already have been aware, I've never made a systematic study of theology, and as I'm kind of illiterate in that, or you know, I've sort of tasted it from the outside. But I mean, this is what Orthodox sociologists think of me in relation to sociology, and historians think of me in relation to history, and philosophers certainly think of me in relation to philosophy, and uh, it worries me. But you, know, uh, yeah. uh, you are a chimera, uh, but we'll get a loop. One of the things that doesn't show up so much in the book is the, the role of the state yeah. in, and political authority, and particularly debates around sovereignty in constructing our sense of the, the necessity of the expulsion of religion and the formation of the kind of public-private yeah. divide. Um, although it's kind of crucial to our current both kind of material practices of how we negotiate secularity and its conceptual kind of operations. And I just wondered that the, the, there's this, you, get, you very much specify, you're talking about Latin Christendom, and then the, in Latin Christendom, there's this hugely significant move, particularly from Pope Galatius onwards in the, in the kind of fifth century, of the doctrine of the two. And so that there should be a proper division, and it, and it is a theological division, Christ, after Christ, there can be no sacral kingship. And there's always an attempt to overcome that, and we yeah. have, this is kind of, Kantorowicz's point about the 
attempts to kind of re-sacralize political authority. It, into the modern period, we have this debate where Root has this great line about who, who's going to join the, the two-headed eagle again, that, that we've got to kind of have reconnect them. And Rousseau looks at some kind of civil religion, Hegel reading Rousseau, and particularly the early Hegel, kind of has this idealized Greek religion where he says everything's operating together and the political and the religious are all. And we've kind of rejected that view, you know, particularly post-Second World War and gone back to a kind of stricter public-private divide. One of the things I'm interested in, you see it particularly working out in Europe, and this is a lot of the contest over Islam, which has obviously <coughs> pressed the question, yeah. is precisely in a context of hyper-diversity brought on by economic globalization and migration, when very different constructions of the sense of what it means to be religion in public and the public-private divide are operating, and they're not operating divided by geography. There's Indian secularity, there's Chinese secularity, here's Western Latin secularity, but they're neighbors on the same street. In that context, we still have this Latin Christian legacy mixed up with post-enlightenment debates about public-private divide and should the state reconcile the doctrine of the two or should they be separated and how does that operate? Adjudicating over these multiple iterations of secularity and public religion, if you like. <coughs> And I'm just, that's a kind of material description, which I, you, know, you may or may not disagree with. My sense is you would agree with that yeah, kind of account. Yeah. Normatively and prescriptively, what are the ways in which, and, and you've been involved in public you know, deliberations about this, normatively and pres prescriptively, how, how do we kind of conceptualize the the proper kinds of adjudication without slipping back into one or other of these kind of options on, on the table? Or do you think we just have to operate with those options on the table? Or is there some other kind of, you would prescribe some other kind of way? Yeah. It seems to be a very fundamental debate that's always pressing this iteration of belief and unbelief, particularly as, as it presses upon the notions of how the sovereign how sovereignty gets both constructed, we, can't, we can no longer have the two, we need one, uh, or we need to fragment it, or we need to federalize it, or that, but the, the, the place of religion and its press upon the coherence and the integrity of the political sovereign has been a key neuralgic point about, around which secularity is both produced and kind of normatively yeah. prescribed. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, it's a very, very important question, and I wish I had a you know, really very good answer. But I have some beginnings of an answer because we've had to fight it out in my society. So, we, so I think the really massive fact about our tradition and how it still weighs on us is that we came out of Christendom or Christendom society, so there was the absolute unity, uh, and the there was complete identity between the kind of unity we obviously need as a society and the kind of unity which can be conferred by confessional conformity, right? So, of course, you get, you know, if you have to understand the early modern wars of religion, people really thought that we can't live together with, with this kind of difference, so there has to be a, you know, Catholic and the Catholic society or Protestant or Pro, uh, ruling a Protestant society, cuius regio, eus religio, et cetera. That's very, very powerful idea. And when we get to the age of the laic regimes, of the secular regimes, they kind of imitated that. I mean, the thing about the Jacobins is they thought you needed a kind of laic morality is what is going to unite the society. And so, you know, Jules Ferry can have the, the schools are going to teach this kind of morale, and, and we're not going to worry the, the, the curé too much, but that's what we've got to do. And you see, this got kind of repeated gets repeated in some of the arguments in France in the 2000s, the argument leading up to the Stasi law, and it get repeated in, in Quebec. So here you have the fusion of two very important points of unity, right? There is, or 
a point of unity and a point of division. They, where the perception is right is that any democratic society needs a very powerful sense of cohesion in order to have the solidarity, in, in order to have people do what they've got to do without being you know, at bayonet point, uh, forced to pay their taxes, and for all these, in order to have even a debate which people can have confidence in, I have to know that you're really talking about the common good when we exchange and not thinking about your, just your gang over there and not worried about us and so on. So, you need this powerful sense of, of, uh, of unity. And if, you, if you're Rousseau, who saw that, you think, well, it has to have a religious uh, expression. So there's a kind of civil religion. And we can't have a civil religion in the present stage in the West, a degree of, of our uh, diversity. So how to resolve that. So we do need a very strong sense of common commitment to the institutions, a very strong common ethic. And I think I'm reaching for the one Rawlsian idea I really accept, the idea of, a, of an overlapping consensus, that the grounds for accepting this, in your case, your case, your case, your case, are going to be different. And so the, the difficulty is getting people over the almost unreflecting idea that comes to us from our whole past, that you can't unify the society unless you have, uh, uh, in, if you like, a civil religion, I mean, a real religion, a civil religion, but there's not room in this country for, you know, as they say in Westerns, you know, there's not room in this country for you and me and sort of thing. And that is, that requires a new kind of um, invention of new kinds of patriotism, which are hard to get people to accept, but we're, we're stuck in the point where we can't do otherwise. And the result of not finding that, that kind of solution is the encroachment, once again, of old laic ideas in which, which uh, managed to stigmatize new minority religions, and that meets a certain gut reaction with lots of people by putting them on the wrong side of a very old ethic of laicite, right? So there is this danger of religion. It mustn't be allowed too much scope in the public sphere. I mean, the whole, see, the whole history in France of, of difficulties of allowing fed you, you know, what do you call it, Corpus Christi manifestations and so on, it comes out again when people say in Marseille, these Muslims are praying in the street. I mean, what's going on? You know, I mean, okay, maybe it's obstructing the traffic, but it's it's not treated as it's a problem obstructing the traffic. It's treated as <gasps> they're creeping up on us, you see? And <clears throat> we have a big, big battle, which this easily turns into Islamophobia, of course, with the geopolitical situation not, not helping. So we're in that situation where we have to fight back against this kind of secularism slash laicite, depending on what language <coughs> you're, you're speaking. And then we have a series of, of dilemmas, obviously arise from this, which you have in this country keep rising, whether the application of a certain rule is going to involve, uh, as it were, uh, overriding people's conscience. So you have you need all sorts of issues arise about, you know, People practicing abortion in a clinic, and the nurse says, "No." I mean, okay. and so I mean, the kind of solution we propose to the Quebec population, which is yet to be accepted, is one which puts extreme importance on liberté de conscience, freedom of conscience, and tries to combine that as best as possible with a state which is not aligned with anyone, any particular religious position, any particular non-religious philosophical position anti-religious position, right? But has really is extreme, I mean, the, in other words, the two basic goals are non-alignment of the public institutions and liberty of conscience. So, and of course, this is in a context where we're talking about the great importance of, uh, you know, reasonable accommodation, right? So, uh, 
you find constantly that the like idea is, why should we accommodate I mean, people want to get a job in the public sector, but they have to wear the, ah, but this is, you know, this is threatening my cité, and they become very hard-nosed about any kind of freedom of conscience. It gets, it gets buried in the idea we need this common like commitment, right? Isn't, isn't the paradox there, you're at once calling for a far more radical secularity of state authority. Yeah. Well, and what the, the reaching for the laicite is a kind of unconscious reaching for a set of very kind of thick, almost sacral yeah, that's right. commitments and stabilize. Now, you, they're, a verse, they're kind of a Christian right versions of that in this country. We yeah. need to stabilize the country through a return to a certain Christian morality. Now, the, the, the direct, I would say, the parallel to that in France is the reaching for a certain That's kind of right. republican virtue and laicite, and this is what it means to be French, and it's a kind of a deep, visceral, yeah. almost sacral idea in, in, in a kind of Durkheimian sense of, yeah. of sacrality, yeah. um, which, which t in order to stabilize this political order, which so we're back to Rousseau. It's, yeah, it's a, a highly disenchanted, we might say, yeah. form of sacrality, but it's still a kind of sacrality. Absolutely. I mean, and it's so a what you're asking is too. much yeah, yeah, more yeah. emptied out. And I'm not sure that's it might be descriptively possible. I'm not sure it's 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 meaningfully plausible that 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 it, you know the the sense in which you can public officials and a state and it seems to be that's what Rousseau and Hegel and I, that, that's part of the debate, like. We're always reaching for some kind of sacralization of political order, and that seems to be an inherent moment in all forms of political order, and that's part of the problem. I, I, I'm going to um, let Professor Taylor answer that question tomorrow, right here, <laughs> at uh, the Conference on Religious Order. We, we have to be out of here relatively soon. I'm going to give him time to thought. Talk. He won't have to talk for a while before he can think of an answer. Uh, he'll have all night to think about it. I want to thank all of you for being here, and I especially want to thank Professor Taylor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.